Yo, what's up? Welcome to the gym. Thank you so much for being here. Happy Monday, everybody. And uh, thank you all for the hype to get this stream kicked off. Wow. Look at all this. Dang. Crazy, crazy. We got a hype train going on. All that. I uh, got a lot of people to thank. Holy smokes. Thank you, Chicken Strip, for the sub. Stealthy Boy, Peter, Trippy Twitches with the five gifteds, Constantinos, Nick Rosie with the sub, Berlumin Onion, Grigner with the gifted sub, The Last Porg with the sub, Sonar Sup, Lunch Bucket, DNGI, Hookshot, Icky, Massive, Mark. Thank you all so much for the. Uh, for the support, I appreciate it. That uh, that is that is very cool. I uh, really appreciate the support. Thank you guys for the uh, for the hype surrounding the uh, Indie Regional Championships as well. Thank you, Maddox TCG for the sub. Yeah, we got there. All right, it's two thousand three hundred player tournament finished in the top eights with uh, with Chen Pao Bax Caliber. At the uh, Indie Regionals. Yeah, um, I'm hyped. That was pretty sick. You know, thanks, BTC, for the five gifteds. Kami Mothman with the sub. Yo, thank you. And, uh, yeah, it's cool, you know? I mean, like, back in my day, they used to only give you $750 for a top eight. Now you get three grand. Yeah, these are much... It's much easier to stomach losing in top eight than it used to be. That's for dang sure. <laughs> used to be like, bro, all that work and I don't even get a comma, dude. This is terrible. <laughs> they used to be absolutely horrible. <laughs> You'd be like, dang, man, I played, uh, I played all weekend and didn't get anything. Uh, seven hundred fifty dollars. It used to be seven hundred fifty for a top eight. Now it's three grand. So it's like, all right, yeah, that that feels better. Uh, so yeah, that uh, that was nice. Nice little pick me up. Feels good. All in all, uh, had an absolutely amazing weekend. I mean, this was one of my favorite tournament experiences ever, and not just because obviously Chen Pao backs caliber happened to treat me nice, but uh. But because I just had an amazing time. I went out there uh, early on um, on Thursday with the Full Grip Games uh, crew because they were vending. So huge thank you uh, to everybody who showed up and supported the shop at Full Grip Games, checked out the booth, stood in line to sell cards, did business with us. Thank you. That was a huge huge uh you know event for us and it really uh it was our biggest it was full grip's biggest event ever so huge thank you to everybody who is uh you know who supported the shop and and turned up to the booth this weekend it was an awesome weekend for us at the shop so thank you for that but i went out with full grip early and you know uh while everybody else was setting up uh, i went out thursday and Decided I was gonna go for a little jog, so I went out to uh, I went out to this park outside Indy. Uh, it was like Eagle something Park or something, and then uh, I did a I did a seven mile run. Uh, thank you, Xen Quell Chen for the Prime sub. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I did a seven mile run and I was feeling very ambitious. I was like, oh yeah, this seven mile run, I'm going to kick this thing's butt. Right. And I got like four miles in, it was 85 degrees, the middle of the day. I was running trails, like uneven trails with lots of ups and downs. I was hurting, dude. I was freaking hurting, but, uh. Made it through the seven mile run, feeling accomplished. That was great. Uh, met up with the full group guys, went out to dinner. And then on Friday, had a very productive day. Uh, I got to meet up with a with a guest who I'm going to be featuring on some of my upcoming 
docu-series videos that I am creating for YouTube. So I met up with another guest, had a very nice, productive interview. Uh, I'm really excited about these now. I'm, I've got three interviews under my belt. Each of them has like an hour to two hours of content, like to like to pull from, you know, these are like big interviews I'm doing. I think this one was about an hour and a half, two hours. So like, uh, three big interviews. Um, and I've got at least two more interviews scheduled for NAIC so far, you know, thank you. Cacturn Jack for the, uh, for the five gifts. Appreciate you, Jack. It was nice seeing you guys at, uh, at Indy. It was a huge, it was a huge, like, morale boost and, like, blessing to get to see all of our local league guys out at the Indy Regionals. Like, it was so sick. I I loved seeing you guys there. It was really cool to kind of get to, uh, to get to hear how you guys, you know, were doing throughout the weekend. So, huge shout out to everybody from Full Grip who made the trip out, all the GLC players, Jack, Craig, um, everybody, JD, uh, Alec, John, Ben, Ben Peacock almost made day two. Hunter almost made day two. Hunter and, and Ben Peacock were like on tear. They were like, you know, got to see Cole there too. Uh, Cole played in the 06 event. Yeah. There's a lot of really cool stuff. Nick Rosie saw you there. Yep. So... Uh, yeah, I got matchup breakdowns. Listen, I'm going to be, listen, I got a lot to yap about today. All right. Dylan made day two. Yes. Shout out to Dylan. I did see Dylan. Dylan made day two. Um, but it was cool getting to see specifically, you know, the GLC league players, you know, showing up and tearing it up at Indy it was really cool. So, uh, that was, that was neat to see. And also like, Cause, cause I love seeing people enjoy multiple formats. So, right. So like getting to see the GLC players enjoy standard some, and then play GLC side events. And cause that's what I like doing. Right. I, I also like mixing it up in multiple formats. It, variety is the spice of life. You know, honestly, you know, playing specifically sta playing only standard is so boring and also can get like, you know, monotonous. So mixing it up, it really makes things more fun when you mix it up. It just makes you appreciate all the formats more when you mix it up, frankly. Uh, as I think you could see evidenced by my uh, by my my time that I had this weekend. So um so yeah, really cool seeing the GLC heads there. That was awesome. Yeah, let me get uh let me get chatters up here. All right, there you go. On the stream for all the VOD. Shout out to all you homies out there watching the VOD channel. Yo, what's up? Thank you guys for being here. Um, so yeah, on, on Friday, um, I woke up early, uh, went over, got a good interview in. I'm so excited to show you guys that, uh, so excited to show you guys what I've been working on, but these projects are going to take a little while, probably around the you know, they'll be coming out around the summer. It'll be what I'm kind of like doubling down on and 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 uh, releasing this summer. A lot of really cool, you know, kind of long-term projects that I've been working on for the last month or so. And the goal is to have at least probably two of these documentary videos out by like Worlds. That's the goal. So uh, I definitely want to get two of them out by Worlds. If I could get three of these documentary style videos out by the time Worlds happens, that'd be like, that'd be sick. So that's like the, two is like, I think I have to get two out. Three would be insane. Um, To give you guys a little bit of a timeline on that. So I did an, a nice interview Friday morning and then uh, came back and was just in time for the 06 event. And uh, the 06 event was really cool. I did have the option to play either Gym Leader Challenge or the 2006 side event. Uh, apparently the Gym Leader Challenge side event had over 100 people on Friday and over 140 people on Sunday. Oh, huge shout out to everybody who participated in the uh, Gym Leader Challenge side event. That was freaking sick incredible turnout. I mean, just awesome to see 
so much love and interest for the, uh, you know, for for our fan made format. I mean, it really is. Uh, it's huge for the community to have that. So amazing stuff. I heard a lot of people, you know, buying their gym leader challenge decks, building decks for the first time, enjoying the format, telling me about how their games went. It was uh, it was awesome. And so I had the option to play gym leader challenge or uh or 06. I chose to play in the 06 event because I've got all of these 06 decks built, but I've never gotten I have never gotten to compete in a 2006 tournament, right? I compete in gym leader challenge tournaments every week at my local shop, right? So like I love gym leader challenge. I play it every single week. But two, a 2006 tournament, I have the decks built. I have never participated in a 2006 tournament. So I had to take that opportunity like how could I not? So I was thrilled about that. You know, thank you, Brandon Alaskan Hero, for the uh, tier three sub. I really appreciate that. So I had to take that that opportunity to play 2006. Uh, it actually taught me a lot about the format. And that's the thing is like you can kind of you can read about 2006 format. You can you can watch 2006 content. You can play single games of 2006 format but you don't really learn a lot about the depth of the format until you actually get into a tournament setting right so i was learning so much about like 2006 format and what it's like to actually play in a competitive setting in 2006 i was like just learning so much as the event was going uh, and it was it was awesome so I, uh, I'll talk real quick about the 2006 event. I was able to win the 2006 event, by the way, with uh, Drag Trode. It was a very, uh, very fun deck. I'll show you guys the deck that I played. I have it with me. Um, but I have my Chen Pao deck spread out right now, so... Uh, I won the 2006 event. There were 33 players, so great turnout for the uh, great turnout for the 2006 event. It was five rounds of Swiss, and then it cut to a top four, and then top four was best of three cut. So like, it was a really cool little tournament. Little tournament, it really was. Um, oh, you know how I'm gonna do this? I actually have a genius idea. This is. This is next level. All right, because I want to show you guys the actual cards, because the actual cards are really cool. All right, I've got a genius idea cooked up. Hold on, hold on. Check this out. Because here's the here's the deck I played to a top eight finish at the main event, but we're not there yet. I'm taking you through the weekend. Hold on. Dude. Was my list not actually Chuck's top eight list? Holy smokes. My list was different? That's crazy. I thought I was playing Chuck's top eight list. Oh, well, oh, well. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to get another play mat, and I'm going to overlay it on top of this so I can show off the 06 deck. Play mat -ception. Oh, yeah, dude. This is nuts. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So yeah, check this out. All right, so on Friday, I played in the 2006 tournament, uh, and I played Drag Trode. So the idea of Drag Trode, and this is honestly, I consider Drag Trode to be, oh man, that's, that's not what I want. There. I consider Drag Trode to be like one of the coolest, uh, like one of the coolest decks of all time. Honestly, it's like, it's just so freaking sick. And when I explain it to you guys, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, this play mat is from an artist, an illustrator, uh, Sean Price. Uh, he is a buddy of one of, of, he is a buddy of my tattoo artist, Taylor. So that's, uh, that's where I got it from. So anyways, 
the the main character in the drag trug deck is the rocket sneasel ex so like you know that i had to play my boy rocket sneasel ex this deck plays four rocket sneasel ex think about this this is an ex pokemon that you can level ball for Level ball is is not legal in this format, but this guy's only got 90 hit points and it gives up two prizes. And it's a main attacker. It's a main attacker, okay? This is like your main attacker in the deck. It's a 90 hit point Pokemon EX. I mean, it really kind of, it got me real like revved up to play, uh, to play Pokemon. Starting the weekend off with a 2006 event, got me so fired up to play Pokemon because this was, it was so much fun. So I'll lay out the list and I'll kind of explain to you guys what the deck does. And, uh, oh, sick. It's already kind of like in order. All right. Oh yeah, this is, this is sick. Like the aesthetics and the vibes of this deck are just absolutely nuts. It really is uh, so cool. And if you're interested in learning more about like the 2006 format or, or retro and stuff like that, um, me and Chip actually did play a 2006 matchup and we made a nice YouTube video on our, on our gameplay. He played Lugia Steelix Blastoise and I played this drag trode deck. So if you're interested in seeing some, you know, nicely edited kind of gameplay of the, uh, of the deck in action, you can check that out. It's on my YouTube channel, but this, uh, honestly piloting this deck got me in a tournament setting. Piloting this deck in a tournament setting got me so revved up to play cards, uh, just because it was that, it was that fun. Like just playing the deck was so much fun, and I think you'll kind of see what I'm talking about as I, uh, as I get this thing laid out and start kind of like yapping about what the deck does. And as I was playing this format, you know. <clears throat> Uh, what people say about like, oh, the game was better back when there was no professor's research, you know, I started to feel a little bit of that as I was, as I was playing like kind of slightly slower pace, more methodical games of the Pokemon TCG. Yeah, you know, I was like, dang, man, this era is gone, right? It's gone. It's just gone. It's a different time now. Games are much faster. It just is what it is. And we're never going back. And, you know, that's okay. Um, it's just different. And these formats will always kind of exist here uh, that you can revisit. But there is something very nice uh, about the pace of these games. And they do feel a little bit more like Gym Leader Challenge. So I think, like, that's one of the draws of Gym Leader Challenge is that Gym Leader Challenge kind of feels like retro in some ways. And I think that that's, like... One of the reasons that I really like Gym Leader Challenge is because it's got like just a slightly slower pace. Uh, there are slightly more turns in a Gym Leader Challenge game than there are in a game of standard, right? With no two prize Pokemon and stuff like that. And uh, it, it, in a lot of ways, Gym Leader Challenge is like a more accessible retro format, right? It's It's a more accessible way to play strategies that feel older which is uh which is really cool so this was the drag trode deck that i played and uh and won the 2006 side events there were uh there were five rounds and it was uh it was an awesome time i actually posted about some of my rounds on the X application. So I'm going to pull that up real quick. And uh, the freaking X application. Honestly, dude, what the heck? Twitter. All right. So <clears throat> here are my rounds. Round one, I played against Niddle Queen and was able to win. Niddle Queen is the deck that Pablo Meza got uh, top four at the World Championships with in 2005, I think. Right? Um, so, and Niddle Queen also won the 2005 World Championships as well. So, Niddle Queen, very good, uh, very good deck. Uh, and then I played against Mutric in round two, which is the deck that 
um, that Jason Klasinski won the 2006 World Championships with, and I was able to beat that as well. Uh, Arcanine EX I played against round three, which is kind of like a disruption. Think of like a crushing hammer style spread deck. That's kind of what Arcanine EX is. It's like this big beat stick guy, and then you play a bunch of energy removals and stuff like that. I lost the Nitto Queen in round four, um, which was tough. I made a crucial misplay, which I learned from, and was able to use to beat Nitto Queen 2-0 in my top four match. Uh, I played against Mutrick again in round five and was able to beat it. And then in the finals, I 2-0'd an LBS deck to take the win. So <clears throat> to kind of give you like the quick rundown of what this 2006 deck does, I know that this is going to kind of be really in the weeds for a lot of people and that looking at all these different cards that do a whole bunch of different stuff is like very intimidating for someone who like doesn't know anything about what this stuff does. But I'm going to break it down real simple for you uh, and show you it's actually not that bad. This is like one of the easier 2006 decks to learn. There are basically three major players in the in the drag trope deck, okay? And they all work together perfectly. I mean, it is just uh, it, it's a super easy deck to follow once you kind of learn what these guys do. Dark Dragonite has the Dark Trance Poke Power, which just allows you to move your darkness energy around the board, like a complete toolbox, right? You just can move your dark energy anywhere you want. And all of these energy are dark energy. You've got dark metal energy, which counts as a darkness energy and a metal energy. You've got darkness energy, which is like, you know, a darkness energy, but it boosts your damage output by 10. You've got rocket energy, which uh, counts as two darkness energy, boosts your damage by 10, and gets discarded at the end of the turn. So kind of like triple acceleration energy or something like that. And then you've got good old-fashioned rainbow energy. And most of us know what rainbow energy does. You place 10 damage on your guy when you attach it, and it counts as all different energies. Now, what was interesting about this era of the Pokemon TCG is that there was no basic darkness energy at this time. <clears throat> there was no basic darkness energy. Notice how the list plays no basic darkness energy because basic darkness energy did not exist yet and basic metal energy did not exist either, which is why you have funny special energy like dark metal energy just so decks can play more than four dark energy, right? Uh, so this deck is playing exclusively special energy because that's the only thing that could pay for darkness energy at this time. So Dark Dragonite allows you to move your uh, allows you to move your darkness energy around the board. So all of these special energy you can move around with Dark Dragonite. This pairs perfectly with Dark Electrode. Dark Electrode has the Darkness Navigation Poke Power, which allows you to search your deck for a darkness energy or a dark metal energy and attach it to Dark Electrode. But you can only do that if Dark Electrode doesn't have any energy attached to it. So what you do is you use Darkness Navigation to search your deck for Darkness Energy, right? And then you move that Darkness Energy off of Dark Electrode with Dark Dragonite, and then you can attack with Rockets and Easel EX. See, that's not very hard to learn, right? It's pretty easy, actually. You set up Dark Electrode. Dark Electrode accelerates the energy from the deck. You set up Dark Dragonite. Dark Dragonite moves the energy off of Dark Electrode to your attackers so that you can use Dark Electrode every turn of the game. So if you're perfectly set up and you have two Dark Electrode in play, which almost never happens, okay, but if you've got two Dark Electrode in play, that means that you get to search your deck for two Darkness Energy and then move them to whatever attacker you want with Dark Dragonite. And you can do that every turn. And you can see how powerful that is because Rocket Sneasel EX is an insane attacker. So Rocket Sneasel EX has the Drag Off attack, which is weirdly worded. Uh, it's worded for double battles, which is why if you read this card, it's not gonna make a lot of sense. It says, before doing damage, you may switch one of your opponent's bench Pokemon with the defending Pokemon. 
That much makes sense. Obviously, you switch in uh, a bench Pokemon, right? And then it says, if you do this, this attack does 10 damage to the new defending Pokemon. That makes sense as well. Then it says, your opponent chooses the defending Pokemon to switch. That line makes no sense. That makes it sound like your opponent chooses the bench Pokemon to come into the active. That's not how it works. Uh, this is worded that way for double battles, which were quickly, you know, weeded out. They were trying to make double battles a thing during this, like, you know, era. Uh, they didn't really last, but for a little while they were trying to make it so that you could have two active Pokemon, which, you know, that's that's worded for that. But that didn't end up taking off. So drag off allows you to, like, bring in one of your opponent's bench Pokemon and... Uh, and do some damage to it. With Darkness Energy, you could do a little bit of extra damage. And then Dark Ring does 30 damage plus 10 more damage for each of your Darkness Pokemon in play. So if you've got all these Darkness Pokemon in play, then you could do a lot of damage. I mean, you can hit up to like 100 damage with Dark Ring, uh, which one hit KOs a lot of cards in this format. And being able to like one hit KO things really quickly with Rocket Sneasel EX, especially if you can bring stuff up into the active spot and then one hit KO it, it is, uh, it's just really powerful. So Rocket Sneasel EX is fantastic, but it's weak to fighting. So this deck also plays Rocket Scyther EX, which is really good for the Nidoqueen matchup, right? Because Nidoqueen is a fighting type Pokemon, so you're not going to want your fighting weak, uh, you know, Sneasel out there uh, getting one hit KO'd easily. So you use Rocket Scyther EX, which you can turn into a grass type Pokemon. Nidoqueen in 2006 is weak to grass. So then you can uh, attach Rainbow to it, make Scyther grass type and darkness type, and you can use its slashing strike attack to one hit KO Nidoqueen. And that's really, you know, what you got to rely on in order to uh, to beat the Nidoqueen Queen deck, which I was able to do successfully. Now that's kind of like just the that's kind of like the quick rundown of the Drag Trode deck. It really is a super fun deck to play. You use Dark Electrode to accelerate energy into play. You use Dark Dragonite to move the energy around, and you take big knockouts with Rocket Sneasel EX. It's by far my favorite retro deck that there is. It's just such a fun cool deck you even get to play this card desert ruins which is like a shrine of punishment for those of you guys that kind of remember shrine of punishment or it's kind of like the new frost last that pings 10 damage on your opponent's pokemon ex between turns but desert ruins only activates on pokemon ex that have 100 hit points that have a base hit points of 100 right and Rocket Sneasel has a hit points of 90, and Rocket Scyther EX has hit points of 80. So you can play Desert Ruins to like bring all of those big Pokemon EX into range and then one hit KO them with your Sneasel, which is really fun. It's super cool getting to play a card like this that's like an EX hate card, but it doesn't hit your EXs, which is like really gnarly for this deck. The, uh, the Dark Dragonair does help you to set up. I use this Dark Dragonair quite a bit. It's got the Evolutionary Light Poke Power, which allows you to search your deck for an Evolution card and put it into your hand. But you can only use Dark Dragonair when it's in the active spot. So uh, there was like a lot of really fun and interesting turns where you're like using Rocket Scyther to like bounce, right? Because bounce allows you to switch with one of your bench Pokemon. You might bounce into Dark Dragonair and then use Dark Dragonair's Evolutionary Light to go find an Evolution Pokemon, uh, like Dragonite or something, then retreat the Dark Dragonair and and then use... It's like you have to do cute little things like that all the time when you're playing this format. And, uh, and the format is just really deep. Like on a base level, that's what that's what like the Drag Trout deck does. But there are so many little nuances in the format and cards that make things really interesting. There's a lot of counterplay. Like, you know, these cards are specific texts for Meg Cargo and Pidgeot. Um, Pidgeot. <laughs> Pidgeot in 2006 format is the same thing as Pidgeot EX in this format. And it's very good. So this Soul Rock shuts off Pidgeot so long as Lunatone's in play. But you have to have both of them in play. So it's like a little counter but then your opponent can play a card that counters these guys so there's a lot of counter and counterplay and it's uh it's it's super neat so 
this was so much fun to play. Uh, I had I had an absolute blast. And uh, the cool thing is, since I won, I earned a trophy card for the win. This was signed by Jimmy Ballard, okay, who you may know as the uh, tournament organizer from Day 2 Events. Jimmy Ballard actually used his Evolutions deck to finish second place at the 2006 World Championships. So, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, it's funny that, like, Jimmy signed his own card for his event, but he did, he finished second place at the 2006 World Championships with this card, right? Like, with Eevee and the Evolution EXs. So, that was really cool. This is, like, a little slice of history here. Jimmy Ballard who is the event organizer for Day 2 Events, actually got second place at the 2006 World Championships with his Evolutions deck. This is the signed trophy card that he gave out, you know, to me for winning uh, Friday's 06 event. So that was uh, that was really cool and really special because this EV is like a card that was actually in his deck. So I really, uh, I really like that. That was awesome. So... Feeling really good. I had a lot of very thought-provoking games on. Uh, I had a lot, a lot of really thought-provoking games on Friday, and it really got my, uh, got my brain going for Pokemon cards, and got me kind of excited to play, uh, to play on Saturday. I was at first nervous about what deck I was going to pick for the main event. Um, I did not know exactly what I was feeling. Uh, Jesse was trying to get me on Dialga V-Star. And if you remember, I didn't have the strongest outing with Dialga V-Star at the European International Championships. I was definitely a Dialga V-Star believer, uh, as I'd been talking about. Uh, on the podcast, you know, on the tag team podcast, as I've been talking about, uh, on stream, I mean, you guys know, I, I definitely, I definitely have been, have been talking the talk about Dialga, right? That deck is crazy. It has definitely got potential. Uh, I think JW asked me on the, on the podcast why I was considering playing Dialga V-Star for the European International Championships like weeks ago. He's like, why would you play a deck like that? And I was like, dude, well, because I think the deck's broken. Like, bad decks are considered bad until they're considered good. I mean, they just are, right? Like, we literally did that with Maridon EX. Why is it so hard for you to believe that, like, this Dialga Matang deck is not actually a tier one deck? Like, why is it hard for you to believe that this deck is not the real deal? Like, we just, sh we just showed everybody that Maridon's a real deck. Like, just you know, months ago, right? And, uh, you know, I, I think that I kind of was like keyed into the fact that Dialgo was definitely a top tier deck, but I didn't have the, I didn't have the perfect 60. I was kind of like in the right direction with a lot of the Dialga deck, but uh, I think like the Arvins had to go, right? And that was kind of like, that was, that was where I was kind of hung up on the list, is I was running Arvins still. The Arvins just had to go, turn it into a research Iono deck, and just, like, draw a bunch of cards. And those decks really are, like, my bread and butter. I do love a deck that just plays, like, four research and, and four Iono. Um, and, uh, and it's just mad consistent. I think that the player that should be credited with, uh, I mean, pretty much discovering the perfect... Uh, the perfect Dialga deck and playing it to success. I mean, obviously Andrew Hedrick won uh, and deserves a lot of credit, but it is Drew Kennett. You should absolutely, uh, you should absolutely know that Drew Kennett uh, pretty much developed and perfected the Dialga V Star deck, and I think everybody was pretty much playing Drew Kennett's Dialga deck, from what I could tell, because. If you look at Jesse Parker was playing Drew Kennett's like Dialga deck basically, and Jesse Parker was talking to Drew Kennett before the event. Uh, Gabe Smart, Andrew Hedrick, all the guys that were playing Dialga, they had talked to Drew Kennett, and Drew Kennett 
kind of got them all hip to like, this is the best way to play Dialga, right? So like everybody uh, was kind of like, you know, zeroed in on on what Drew Kennett had uh, had built. I was right about Prime Catcher. Uh, Drew Kennett was on Max Belt at EUIC and Orlando. Um, I was right about Prime Catcher being the ideal uh, the ideal A spec for for Dialga. So I was right about that. Um, but I was a little hung up on like the the Evo TMs and the uh, uh, the Evo TMs and the Arvins, and I think the list just gets like a little bit better when you cut out the Evo TMs and the and the Arvins and put in real supporters, just like research. Also, the fourth rod was like another uh, another really big uh, boost to the Dialga deck. I was on three rod at the UIC, but I quickly realized four rod and Radiant Greninja is like you know. Uh, perfect right it just gives you another consistency out having the fourth rod you pretty much always want to find those super rods so like um that was uh that was epic too so uh huge congrats to andrew hedrick uh andrew was the only player that i lost to the entire weekend uh in the main event so yeah i do think that uh i think that that this event, the um, this event, the Indianapolis Regional Championships was kind of like the best event for Dialga because there were so many Chen Pao EX. And if we look at the results uh, of the Indianapolis Regional Championships, you'll see. I mean, it was like an absurd, an absurd turnout for. Uh, for Chen Pao. So let's take a look at that real quick. Okay. Yes. I mean, I didn't get to see what the meta share was because I was busy playing, but like, did you guys see what the actual meta share was for Chen Pao at this thing? It was kind of insane, right? Thank you, Dark Assassin, for that sub. Appreciate it. 12%. What was the top played deck? Let me see if I... It was Zard still? Cool. All right, let me see if I can pull up my RK9 um, on here real quick so we could just go through my rounds and talk about... Uh, Talk about what I did and how the tournament went. I took some notes on my phone. I didn't vlog or anything. After, uh, you know, after after interviewing on Friday with uh, with with my guest, who I'm going to be featuring in a in a documentary video, uh, I was like, you know, I've done enough work this weekend. I'm just going to play and have fun. So I took some notes, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't vlog. I wanted to. There we go. All right. So this is this is my tournament right here. Okay. I played against a lot of really, uh, really good players. I mean, it was it was definitely a crazy event. <clears throat> Have we ever got any news about the long ago special project? Soon. I can now say, soon. I couldn't say soon before, but now I can say soon. <clears throat> I'm starting to get some updates on it, and I will let you know soon. <clears throat> okay. So yeah, it was it was insane being at the, you know, being at the top tables in this event and seeing the sheer number of Chen Pao players, it was absurd. I mean, it was like, it felt like the entire, uh, the entire top tables were Chen Pao. It was for a while, right? It was crazy. So uh, here I am playing against Andrew Hedrick for the second time Okay, I played against Andrew Hedrick three times this weekend, and he is the only player I lost 
<laughs> He's the only guy I lost to in the whole room. All right, and I played against him three times. Um. Yeah, he's the only guy I lost to all weekend. I even played another Dialga guy and I beat him twice. <clears throat> so. All right, so the, the meta breakdown was Charizard 24%, Chen Pao 12%, Lost Tina 6, Arc Tina 6, Ancient Bucks, Lugia. Wow, so. So yeah, this was a, uh, I mean, this was a crazy run, and I, I got a lot to talk about here. So it's, uh, it was sick. But yes, uh, when when Chip took this picture, there are six Chen Pao EX decks at tables one to five in round twelve. Absolutely nuts. Chen Pao, Dialga, Chen Pao, Chen Pao, Lucas, Chen Pao, Reagan, Chen Pao. That's just like as far down as you can see. It's Chen Pao, Chen Pao, Chen Pao, Chen Pao, Chen Pao. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so many, dude. Absolutely crazy. It was just Chen Pao domination uh, here. And there were so many Chen Pao mirrors being played just everywhere. Um... I was a little bit, uh, I was a little bit nervous to play Chen Pao. Obviously, if you guys have been watching the stream, then you know that Chen Pao is a deck I have been grinding on stream. I have been grinding pretty much the exact list that I played, um, which you can see right here, right? I mean, this is this is just what I played, right? It is the same thing that I've been playing on stream. Um, I even played the 360 hit point fridges, just like I said I would. I played the four rare candies, just like I said I would. <laughs> I cut the pot, I cut the the canceling cologne, just like I said I would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything that I said I would do, I did. So, yep, just uh, this is literally Reagan Retzloff's top four list from Orlando, minus uh, minus the 70 hit point fridgey. And minus the canceling cologne plus the fourth candy. The fourth candy came in clutch so much. I mean, just like if you watched my top eight match, I prized two superiors, which was I prized two superiors and three water game one, which was really bad. But, uh, you know, I'm cooking their game one. If I was able to find either rare candy, which I play four of, or one of my two superiors, then I would have been able to piece the combo together to knock out both of Andrew Hedrick's Beldum, uh, you know, turn two going first. So like the entire series changes if I just find rare candy or superior. And my deck just failed me, you know, after after Radiant Greninja, Bibarel, Pokestop, just every, you know what I mean? Like I, I saw a lot of cards and I just couldn't get the, the two piece combo, so. That I mean, that just was that was it. That and that's the that is the entire matchup. I mean, us at the uh, all of the Chen Pao players at the top at the top tables, and you'll notice what was I what was I telling you guys the entire time? How many mana fee are being played here? How many mana fee? Zero. I tried to say. There's a gentleman's agreement amongst all of the Chen Pao heads. We don't play Manaphy, okay? That card's terrible. None of us play it. And we all did well. <laughs> and it's like, uh, no, Manaphy's bad. You don't play Manaphy. You just go first and you get the, it, right? You have to max out consistency. Uh... And starting mana fee sucks. Like, once you even get mana fee in play, then, like, you have to either com compromise on only getting one Bibarel out, or, you know, maybe you're short a Bax Caliber, and your opponent can still win those mirrors by, like, targeting down your only Bibarel or targeting down your only Bax Caliber. So, uh, so yeah, so there's no mana fees. So the Chen Pao mirror is the Chen Pao mirror. 
is very much like go first and get the, if you go first in the Chen Pao mirror and you're the first person to take two prizes, be it on a Chen Pao EX or on um, Radiant Greninja double Frigibacks, you will just win the game, right? I mean, that's just like, there's pretty much no way to lose if you get the first two prize take. So the Chen Pao mirror is all about going first. It's coin flip matchup. And the Dialga matchup feels very similar because you're trying to go first and so long as you're the first player to take two prizes, if you go first and get turn two Radiant Greninja on two Beldum, you're winning that game. You're probably winning that game. There are still some routes, but it is uh, it is it is very difficult for the Dialga deck to win if Chen Pao goes first and gets the turn two Radiant Greninja on two Beldum. That is uh, that is very bad for for Dialga if that happens, and. That's what I was going for, right? I mean, that's what I was going for. That's how, uh, that's how I was trying to win uh, in that game one. I have maxed out consistency to try and make those plays happen more often than not, right? And in every other round that I played, um, I was able to get turn two backs caliber attack every every other round, right? I don't think that there was like. Maybe there was a game somewhere where I went first and didn't get the turn to attack somewhere, but it was like negligible and didn't matter. But like, uh, but every other, every other round, I was setting up turn two. Um, except for the, <laughs> except for my top eight match, which was disastrous, right? Absolutely disastrous. But that's how you beat Dialga. You go first, you get the turn two Radiant Greninja, knock out two Beldums, and then uh, you're in the clear. But you need you need that to happen. If your opponent goes, if you struggle to set up at all, Dialga wins. And if Dialga goes first and sets up turn two, they also win. So I would say that Dialga is probably favored into Chen Pao about 60-40. You can win. You can definitely win. But you got to go first and you got to set up strong. And since Dialga is a more simple deck than Chen Pao, um, the Dialga kind of tends to set up just more consistent. Like Dialga doesn't have to be doing anything special to like get a attack turn two, right? And if they just do that going first, they probably win because your best opener is Chen Pao EX, and Dialga doesn't even need. Dialga does not even need a Matang hit in order to get a turn two one hit KO on Chen Pao EX. All they have to do is attach to Dialga V-Star twice, right? It's I mean, it's ridiculous. It's 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 not great. There are a lot of ways to lose. There are a few ways to win, and you can do it, but it is it is slightly unfavorable, I'd say. Yeah, thank you, hot soup that prime sub i appreciate it so let's talk about the rounds there was a lot of chen pao andrew hedrick is the only opponent i lost to all weekend there were a record four chen pao half of top cut was chen pao and i had some tragic draws in uh, absolutely tragic and then in game two against andrew hedrick I had a terrible opening hand, but I had three Iono in it, right? Or I had three Irida in my opening hand. And then Andrew Hedrick Ionos me turn one. And three Irida go to the bottom of the deck. I never saw a Nest Ball or anything, so I couldn't get Radiant Greninja out of the deck. And then what does he do? He Ionos my three Irida to the bottom of the deck, and I get freaking Cypher Maniac off the top, right? In my Iono hand and nothing else. No out to Bieberl, nothing, right? Just just not not squat, bro. This hand is terrible. The Iono hand is like one of the worst hands that I'd seen all tournaments. And I have to go uh and I have to go literally Cypher Maniac pass. Like Cypher Maniac and I'll take the Bieberl next turn. That's how you lose, bro. Like that that is how that is how you lose the game. Yes, 100 percent If you wanted to write up a perfect essay on how to lose at Pokemon cards. Just look at look at my draws in top eight. It was disastrous. It was a train wreck. An absolute train wreck. But that's okay. The deck had earned me $3,000 before it decided to completely spontaneously combust. So I'm okay with that. Thank you, 
Tall Jammer for the sub and the 41 months. I appreciate it. And that's exactly why I said that Cypher Maniac sucks. <laughs> that's exactly why. Because I'm like, you're going to get Cypher Maniac in your hand, and you're going to be like, wow, I wish I could do something with this. Instead, I'll go stack my deck and say pass. And that is exactly what happened in top eight. <laughs> That is exactly, that was my exact prediction. Right. Yes. So, and that's my exact beef with the, the my exact beef with the card is how I ended up, you know, getting, uh, yeah, anyways, it's fine. It is what it is. Oh, thank you, Manderson, for the Prime sub. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. You know what? The deck decided to earn $3,000 before it decided to just completely implode on itself. So that's okay. I can't complain. But it was sad watching the deck. Like, my the first game I get to play on stream all weekend, and the deck just does that. Womp womp. It's all good. I had a, you know, the top eight match was definitely, like, the low point of the entire tournament. Um which is unfortunate that that was the most public facing moment of the entire tournament because uh, the entire the entire weekend was just filled with absolutely incredible rounds and uh, incredible you know play from my opponents and I felt like I was on fire I was really routing things well and I felt like locked in I was just locked in like all weekend I really was like things were going great uh, thank you Ruzzy and ZemQ for the subs, I appreciate that. So let's talk about my rounds a little bit. And uh, I'll tell you guys how they went. All right, let me pull up the old notes app and see what we got. Okay, round one, I played a Chen Pao mirror. My opponent went first, but, uh, and I told you about what it means to be going first in the Chen Pao mirror. Going first is everything because you get to be the one to get the turn two Radiant Greninja. So I lost the flip, and I'm playing a Chen Pao Mirror round one, and I was I was really I was I was hurting right because I'm like dang all right round one Chen Pao Mirror and I'm going second this is this sucks, and my opponent went first got the turn two uh, Radiant Greninja going first I went first game two I got the turn two Radiant Greninja uh, game two and one and then my opponent missed getting a Frigi down turn one game three. I pounced and I go turn two Radiant Greninja and just win. So uh, that's it. Round one was a, uh, a Chen Pao Mirror. Let's see. I can put this. Uh, I can put these notes up here on so you guys can kind of see um, the deck that I play against as I talk about it. So let's see. If I, can I airdrop that? Turn my Wi-Fi on. Airdrop it to Andrew's Mac Studio. All right, let's go. Oh, Ninja was like, was like nuts for sure. There we go. Oh, I'm on a, <laughs> you see my notes to myself. All right, very good. Okay. I bundle my my butt off. I said. All right, let's see. I did, and I did bundle my butt off. Let's see. I don't want to go Google Docs. I want to do like text edit. Yeah, let's do text edit. Okay. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right, so yes, round one is Chen Pao Mirror. Let's get this all organized, looking nice. Okay, cool. Thank you, lovely Foo Foo, for those five gifted subs. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Round two, I play against Charizard. I set up amazing. Um, I just have a, 
I'm playing against Alec Geisler, who's gone for his invite. He's played a lot of uh, Lugia this year um, and is close to his invite. I think he said he only needs 18 more points or something like that. He's very close. And uh, I set up great both games. Uh, game one, I'm just like absolute, and he wasn't playing max belt or anything. So I'm just like shredding Charizards with Chen Pao. And at the end of the game, you know, if if with with Chen Pao, if you could just go one hit KO Zard, one hit KO Zard, and then like Gust Pidgeot, the, that's it. I mean, right, you just win, right? I mean, there's nothing that they can do. So like, if Chen Pao does what it needs to do, it like never loses, which is kind of the insane thing about Chen Pao. And I, I realized as I was like, as I was playing and kind of becoming more inundated with the Chen, the Chen Pao lifestyle, I definitely became a Chen Pao head throughout the event. I was like, if I was not already a Chen Pao head, I had become uh, a Chen Pao truther throughout the event. I was like, dang, this deck is just broken. Like, actually, you could do whatever you want. And uh, it, it feels invincible. You set up, you're invincible, right? Thank you, Brett, for that sub. I appreciate it. So I set up perfectly against Charizard game one. Uh, just melted Charizards easy. And then uh, game two, uh, I was able to get turn two ninja to knock out both Charmanders. And my opponent did not get a Manaphy out. So that was, uh, that was a quick 2-0 question in the chat uh how tougher the matchup gets against zard and a cape uh the cape zard doesn't matter you can still one hit ko a cape zard because uh eight energy does get there and you can also use the iron bundle the iron bundle is low-key goaded uh it's why everybody plays the bundler the bundler is nuts you can just simply ignore the cape charizard the entire game. You can ignore it the entire game. You can either bundle around it, and if they put up a two prizer, you knock it out with Chen Pao. And if they put up a single prizer, you can knock it out with hands. Right? So there's almost no like Yeah, if you if you're just smooth operating and you're doing what you need to do, your ideal board state with Chen Pao is almost always Radiant Greninja, two B Burrell, two Bax Caliber. So like your your entire your entire game, you're basically playing a series of mini games where like if your opponent like knocks out one of your beebs then you gotta like you, you try to get the other bidoof back down right because you're like being cognizant of the fact that like you're always looking out for what are my opponent's wing cons and they're always going to be trying to like ah, get you out of a box or get you out of a beeb right so like you're always like rebuilding your backs or rebuilding your beeb and if they're just knocking out your attackers then you just win guaranteed so like one of their only outs is to like gun down your Bieber L's or your Bax Calibers. So you're constantly doing like, you're rotting in like just the Bidoof, putting the Bidoof back down. Like you never want to get caught, you never want to get caught slip slipping, right? With like no Bieber L out. Or obviously with no Bax Caliber out. So like, um, you obviously cannot protect against losing um, Bieber L as easily if your opponent is taking two turns in a row, which is why Dialga V-Star can be a very bad matchup because there's always this like, okay, my opponent knocks out Bax Caliber, uh, I rare candy into another Bax Caliber, set up another Frigi Bax, right? Or my opponent knocks out Bibarel, okay, I evolve into my second Bibarel, uh, I put down another Bidoof, right? But if your opponent takes two turns in a row, then they can, they can, get you out of your consistency card that you need. They could get you out of the Bieberell or they could get you out of the Bax Caliber um, if they're taking two turns in a row, which is another reason why the Dialga matchup can be pretty sus. So yeah, Iron Bundle's insane. Just allows you to completely ignore cards. I used Iron Bundle extensively throughout the, uh, the entire event. All right, so Charizard, I'm able to win round two. Round three... I uh, play against Arctina. This is uh, Brandon Lane. I'd played against him before. He flips over Arceus, and I am breathing a deep sigh of relief. I told you guys on stream, anytime I sit across from an Arceus player, I'm like, oh, thank God, this deck is not that good. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, bro. Anytime I sit across from Arceus, my opponent flips over Arceus, I'm like, whew. Oh, thank, thank God, I finally get to relax. <laughs> the 
<laughs> get to get. We're gonna get to cruise through this one. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> this deck stinks. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, Arceus is a great matchup for uh, for Baxcalibur. There can be some things that they try to do. What they try to do is they try to law zone both of your. Uh, they try to do that. But like that just doesn't happen. It doesn't. You're annihilating their guys every single turn, right? So like, they have to draw flawlessly and probably go first in order to win. And if they don't, if they don't go first and draw flawlessly, it's not happening. I have in all of the time that I've played online and at these tournaments, I have never had both of my backs caliber lost zoned. I have never actually had that win condition happen. Because it just doesn't really happen that often. Like, they have to have that happen. And it's so hard. You have to go first, you go first, and you have to, like, yeah, it's it's tough. And then, like, they're either playing the Max Belt. Max Belt does help because it can allow them to get the turn two knockout on a, on a Chen Pal. But Brandon was playing uh, Prime Catcher instead. So, like, I understand why you're playing Prime Catcher. You're trying to go for, like, the, you know, law zone both... Uh, Back's caliber deal, but in practice, it just doesn't end up happening that much. So, yeah, uh, Brandon is going for his world's invite. He said he's about 70 points away. He said he's going to like Germany and going to, you know, going to California and like flying all over to try and get his first world's invite. So, good luck to Brandon on that, uh, on that chase. Uh, looks like he didn't get there today or didn't get there this past weekend. Um, and that's unfortunate, but. Uh, yeah, so he's going to be flying around trying to get those 70 points he needs for his invite, and uh, I wish him best of luck doing that. Even the game where Brandon went first, he was not able to get, uh, was not able to win, right? And it's just because you are, as the Chen Pao player, you put your Arceus opponent on a three, you put your opponent on a three-turn clock, right? Because you're going to, you're going to go one Hikeo, one Hikeo, one Hikeo. So, like, they have four turns to stop you, right? It's just not a lot. While their guys are melting, keep in mind, right? Like, their, their dudes are melting. Like, they are, like, every attacker that hits the active is getting absolutely annihilated. So, like, uh, so it is very hard for Arceus to do anything against Chen Pao. That's a very good matchup. Round four, I play against Lexi from Team Girl Power. Uh, she ended up doing fantastic. I think she uh, she finished in the top 64, I believe. Uh, she had a really good run. Um, I think I was her only loss in... Uh, yeah, she ended up with 31 points. Uh, but I think I was her only loss in day one. I think she ended up day one at like 7-1-1 one, and one or something and then she went three and three yes that's it so she started off seven one and one and then went three and three day two and finished in the top 64 but lexi did very good um and the lugia matchup also felt great there's a lot of different things you can do in the lugia matchup uh, i was able to win 2-0 um there's a lot of different things you're able to do in the lugia matchup which which kind of uh uh, are just very good. Like, if your opponent's getting a little bit of a slower start, you can go Prime Catcher, one hit KO, they're Lone Lugia, and they just lose. If your opponent decides to put down two, uh, if your opponent decides to put down two of the little mouse guys, right, two Minchinos, you could just go Greninja and knock out both of those Minchino, right? And then you don't even need, like, a two-prizer on board. You can just go Greninja those. If your opponent's getting a slower start, you can also go Iron Hands, a Lugia V for three prizes. Like, if you get yourself into a weird situation where you're losing by, like, uh, if you get yourself into a weird situation where you're, like, losing by an odd prize count and you need to take three prizes, you can always Iron Hands, a Lugia V, or a Luminian V for three prizes like that options always on the table and you can also do a play where you like radiant greninja the uh you radiant greninja the uh the mincino and hit a lugia v star and then you can hands the lugia v star for three prizes after softening it up with radiant greninja there are so many different ways to win the lugia matchup as the chen pao player and it feels like there are so many ways to lose the chen pao matchup 
as the Lugia player, right? Like there, there are a lot of ways to lose as, as the Lugia player. There are a lot of ways to win as the Chimpao player. So like it feels heavily favored. I would say I feel very confident going into the Lugia matchup. Like that was, uh, that was definitely dope. And, uh, and just the fact that Lugia doesn't set up turn two as consistently as Chen Pao does. And that was like a huge thing that really helped sway this matchup in Chen Pao's favor as well. Lugia is always scary if they go first and they get the turn two one hit KO on your Chen Pao, you're sweating bullets. Like that, that's not great, right? Like you're you're going to have a bad time. If they do that, right, if you open Chen Pao and they open Lugia V, they go first and they go turn two Lugia V star Blammo. Yeah, you, you might lose that one. That's going to be bad because then your options are like, your, your options have, have depleted, right? Because if you go up Chen Pao, knockout, then they have a chance to go down to two prizes remaining and it's just disastrous, right? So you need that to not happen for sure. But that doesn't happen all the time. Like Lugia would have to go first and then they have to have the perfect turn two. You also have to start a Chen Pao, right? If they go first, they get the turn two attack and they knock out a single prizer, that's not a big deal at all. Then you bring up the Chen Pao, you, take, you, you start the trade, right? And that's one of the most broken things about Chen Pao is that you get to go two, four, six, no matter what. And that's kind of what, you know, as I was going through the event, I was kind of, I felt like I was, playing Pokemon cards in four dimensions. You're just like, you're sitting there solitary. You don't really care what your opponent's doing. Uh, you are just figuring out, how do I go two, four, six? And you can pretty much just two, four, six every single game because you're either going take a two prizer with Chen Pao or you're going take two prizes with Radiant Greninja or you're going take two prizes with Iron Hands, right? So every single turn, you only have to have, you only have to have like a, uh, you know, four turns to play the game. You have your one turn of setting up and then you've got three turns of taking two prizes and then the game is over. So that, that's what makes it so broken. And uh, and trying to like find those routes against a deck like Lugia is incredibly easy because Archeops is weak to Iron Hands, right? So that's easy. Uh, Chinchino gets knocked out by Iron Hands. That's easy. Minchino gets knocked out by Radiant Greninja. That's easy, right? So there are all these different ways to to take two prizes against Lugia. It feels very good. You can even take three prizes, as I said before. If like something funky happens, you could you can even take three prizes. So there are just so many different ways to beat the Lugia deck. So ended up going win-win against Alexis. That was uh that was great. Then I start to get a little nervous playing against the Chen Pao head himself, Ji Shen. Uh, I'd spent some time with Ji Shen at the uh, at the LAIC, the Latin American International Championships. Uh, he was rooming with uh, with Grant and Azul and Caleb. And uh, I got to know him a little bit there. And Jishin's actually really cool. He's a very young guy. Uh, I did feel a little bit like an old head at this event. If you look through my... Uh, I played against a lot of children. <laughs> okay. Uh, I played against... I'm letting us a lot of children. I'm starting to feel aged out, bro. I'm not going to lie. Like, Jishen is, like, probably 19. Uh, Andrew Hedrick is, like, actually 19. Uh, Reagan Retzloff is, like, 16. Um, they're a lot of a lot of kids, man. Yeah. I'm getting too old for this. I know. Meanwhile, I'm like, dang, bro, my back hurts. <laughs> my back hurts from all this sitting. I was like... I knew it was bad because before uh, before we sat down to play uh, top eight, before they had picked the stream match, I was sitting behind my chair and I was stretching. Um, I was sitting behind my, my chair stretching and all the kids in top eight were like, what are you doing, Mahone? And I was like, I'm stretching. Oh, you guys never stretched? I'm stretching it out, bro. I've been sitting for like two days straight. <laughs> They're like, well, what are you doing? I'm like literally just stretching a little bit. <laughs> and it was like, it was like they'd never, never seen an old man stretch before. Okay. So anyways, I play against, yeah, you'll be here when you're 35 as well. 
So yes, play against Grand Chen. Grand Chen is the Chen Pao main, and thankfully I win. I win the flip against Ji Shen, but there's lots of drama in our Chen Pao mirror, and uh, and. It, it doesn't just go turn two Radiant Greninja. It doesn't. But like other weird stuff happens and it's like, uh, and, and even though I win the flip, he like still has a chance to win because I whiffed the turn two ninja. So then he's able to like capitalize and, and launch an attack. But then I'm able to knock out his only back's caliber. So there's like, there was definitely some give and take in these games. And it was not just a pure matter of uh, of who went first. And ultimately, I am able to uh, to win game three. Um, and the player who does go first, go first, does win each of the games. But they're not just as simple as like I went turn two Radi Radiant Greninja and won. Because uh, Grant also like didn't get the perfect. Uh, I don't. I don't think Grant got like the perfect turn two either when he played against me, but still ended up winning. It was. Uh, it was definitely like a funky round. But th the player who went first did end up uh, winning. And so I was able to beat Ji Shen. Ji Shen was lamenting that in all of his Chen Pao mirrors, uh, he felt like he was going second more often than not uh, throughout the weekend and was still able to capitalize with a second place finish at the main event, also losing to Andrew Hedrick, who was the bane of all of us this weekend. Yes. So I play against Grant Shen, uh, great player, obviously. With uh, with Chen Pao and taking that win, I felt very good. Going into the next round, I'm playing against Kieran, a fantastic player from Toronto. And I uh, realized very quickly that I am also playing another mirror. So um, nervous about that, but I do win the flip. And I am uh, I'm very thrilled about that. I'm able to go first, uh, get a clean uh, double knockout. Going first, he gets the clean double knockout going first uh, in game two, and I get the clean double knockout going first in game three. Uh, so that ended up uh, that ended up going very well. In um, in my next round, I get paired up against Zach Lesage. So this point, we are both six zero. We're both 6-0. Zach's playing Lugia. Uh, I had seen him uh, kind of down the tables playing Lugia, so I know he's playing Lugia. And uh, then, uh, and before we play, Zach offers to ID uh, with me, and I'm like, nah, bro, I ain't taking no ID. Yeah, we're 6-0. Like, no, 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 no. I think, like, if you want to legitimately have a shot at winning these events, you can't really, why would you? You know, maybe it's because he knows it's a bad matchup, but like he offers the ID and I say no. And uh, and it's funny because that's something Zach and I have had a uh, a history of, of that exact situation happening um, where Zach offers the tie. I say no. And I go on to win because the same exact situation happened at the 2017 North American International Championships. It was our win and in round day two of 2017 NAIC. He offers the ID. I say no, and I will, and I and I win, uh, and go on to make top eight of NAIC. Uh, similar situation. Zach offers the ID so early in the event, and uh, and I'm like, no, I want to play. So, um, so I decide to play, and it's Lugia, and I know from my uh, I know from my matchup earlier that Lugia is a uh, is a good matchup. So I'm able to win round one going first. Uh, and then game two, I am losing, but I have a, I have a route to win. I'm actually very close, uh, very close to winning because Zach makes a crucial error. Um, he discards his therapeutic energy early and starts attacking with Snorlax. And I kind of recognize that even though I'm I'm like kind of bodied, uh, he's got like one prize left to take, right? Um, but I've probably have like three prizes left, and I have a heavily damaged uh, uh, Lugia V Star on the bench that I was able to uh, that I was able to like get into range. I think I have four prizes left actually to his like literally to his like one, right? And uh, 
since his therapeutic energy is down, I don't scoop right away. And I'm like, all right, I could go like Radiant Greninja, Radiant Greninja. And if he can't move the Snorlax, then like I actually just win, right? So uh, he benches another Mincino. And at it, a point where like he needs to not, right? Like he needs to not bench another Mincino because I have four prizes left. And there's like a Chinchino with 90 damage on it that I can knock out. And then there's a Lugia V-Star on his bench with like, 90 hit points. It's like, there's a couple of things. All I need to do is like Radiant Greninja twice in a row. and Or like three times. I need to Radiant Greninja three times in a row. And he benches another Minchino, which allows me to like take a double knockout with Radiant Greninja. I rob the Ninja back in. Take a double knockout with Ninja. The Snorlax stays asleep. And then uh, I, need, I need two more turns. And I get one more turn. The Snorlax stays asleep. He can't find... All he has is Iono, and he can't find a jet energy to wake the Snorlax up, so he passes. And then I'm able to Radiant Greninja again, and I'm one attack away from winning the game. Um, and his Snorlax stays asleep again, but he's able to find a research, and he researches into his deck. Probably still like a 20-ish card deck, and he's able to find a jet energy he needs to win the game. So like game two, he's able to win just barely by getting that Snorlax to wake up. If the Snorlax had stayed asleep and stayed stuck for one more turn, I do win that game too. So there was a little route there that I was able to finesse with Radiant Greninja, but he eventually wakes the Snorlax up and, and goes to a dub. And then in game three, uh, I kind of just, I set up quickly and, and just route him. So it was, uh, it was certainly very, very solid. Then uh, round eight. This is when things start getting weird, okay? Because... At this point, I had played against a lot of decks I expected to see. I had played against Charizard. I had played against a lot of Chen Pao. I had played against Arceus, Giratina. I had played against Lugia. These are all standard fare. I expect to see these things at events. You know what I don't expect to play at the 7-0 table? You know what I was not expecting to see at 7-0 was Dialga, all right? And lo and behold, my round eight opponent is playing Dialga V-Star at 7-0. And, oh, and I'm like, bruh, this is crazy. Dialga, I loved you, Dialga, and you betrayed me. And now I have to face down Dialga at, uh, at round eight. So I'm playing against Justin C. Uh, it was a very... Uh, very nice opponent. Uh, it was cute. His mom came over and took a picture of us playing at the uh, at the top table. It was table one. His mom came over, and took a picture. It was it was super fun, and uh, and we play. He sets up a little bit slowly both games, and uh, I am able to win two zero. Uh, I do the exact the exact kind of play that I talked about in the Dialga matchup. I'm able to go first. I get turn two, Radiant Greninja knock some guys out. There was a, a game where I'm able to like knock out his only Diago V-Star. Like there are opportunities when sometime Diago V-Star decks, like they'll have like a three energy Dialga and a couple of Matangs on the bench, right? And uh, they don't have a backup Dialga yet. And it, if that Dialga V-Star takes like a, a single prize on a Fridgey or something, and then you bring up Chen Pao and you one hit KO the Dialga V-Star, you like, you can pretty much keep them out of a V-Star the entire game. In fact, if that situation happens, you as the Chen Pao player just win, right? And this happens. So let me let me kind of spell it out for you. Say Dialga V-Star goes first, right? But they only get one Dialga V-Star set up and they have two Matang on the bench. And maybe even a Beldum too. Say they have two Matang, a Beldum, and only one Dialga V-Star. And they bring up like the three energy. Zamazenta does not matter, and I'll tell you why in a second. Zamazenta, Zamazenta doesn't matter. People say that the 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 Chen Pao matchup is bad for uh or the Diago matchup is bad for Chen Pao because of the Zamazenta. The Zamazenta actually does not matter. And this is why. So um so if Diago V Star only has one Diago V Star set up, right? And they go up with it into the active spot as it's like the only attacker, right? And they, uh, and say they like, you know, maybe they were going for a turn two V star, but they don't quite hit it. So like they go, uh, just attack with Dialga V, V star. Maybe it's like a three energy Dialga V star and they knock out like a single prizer or something, right? Then you go Chen Pao EX, establish your board, 
one hit KO the Diago V star, right? Then what do they do? Walk me through. What do they do? They don't have a backup Diago V-Star, so they have to go Zamazenta, right? So they go Zamazenta, and they knock out your Chen Pao to go to three prizes remaining, right? Do they put down a bench Diago V? If they put down a bench Diago V, then you go Prime Catcher up the bench Diago V, and you knock it out with, uh, with Chen Pao, right? They would have to bench two Diago Vs. But a lot of times they only run three. So like sometimes if they're struggling to get their Diago Vs out, if they bench a Diago V, then you gust up the Diago V and you knock it out and you take two more prizes, right? And at this point, you're chasing down the Diago Vs. So you're making it very hard for them to build up a V star. So if they decide to go single prize board and they don't bench a Diago V and they just attack with the Zamazenta, then you go iron bundle and you push the Zamazenta out of the active and you iron hands a Matang, right? If they put Mew EX in play, that's always a two prizer you could chase down as well. And that's like how you kind of wrap, that's how you get the matchup go, right? If they do have double V, it's still correct to, uh, you don't have to prime catcher. You can just go, uh, you go bundle, right? So if they go double V on the bench, you go bundle, you push the Zamazenta out of the active. If they feed you a V, you knock it out with Chen Pao. If they feed you a Matang, you knock it out with Iron Hands, right? If they only have one V, you got to go find the prime catcher and bring it up and knock it out. Because that way they guaranteed can't use their V star. But if they have a V with like one energy on it, there's a chance that they don't build up to the five energy guy the following turn, right? Also, Zamazenta can't knock out um, Iron Hands. So like there's another, that's another little, little edge that you have. Like if you go, if you go bundle, right? and then you go hands and knock out a Matang that they promote or a Beldum, they can't Zamazenta that, right? So like there's a lot of little things that you can do to finesse the matchup. And it's actually really easy to go two, four, six if you're the first person to take the first two prizes. But that's the hardest part. Thank you, Dave, for the sub and the 52 months. I appreciate that. You have to be the first person to go to take two prizes. And... It's not easy. Like I said, because Dialga can just manually attach to Dialga and knock out a Chen Pao. They don't even have to be set up to knock out Chen Pao. Chen Pao has to be set up in order to knock out a Dialga V-Star. Like, has to be set, has to be set up well, right? Yes. Jesse says it best, right? Uh, Dialga has an easier time setting up their board than Chen Pao, which just makes it slightly favored for Dialga. Exactly, right? So like all the times Dialga goes first, they're going to be heavily favored. And even the times Dialga goes second, it's a little easier to set up Dialga than it is to set up. Uh... So yeah, there's there's a bunch of things going, going for you. But against Justin, I'm able to go turn two Radiant Greninja, knock out two Beldums. I'm pretty much, Justin does not announce Star Chronos versus me in this entire set. Like that is how aggressively I chased down the Beldums with Radiant Greninja. I chased down his Dialga Vs with Prime Catcher. Justin, in round eight, Justin does not announce uh, Star Chronos against me. That's how dominant, that's how dominant of a showing it was from the Chen Pao deck. So at this point, I'm feeling pretty good about it because I'm like, all right, I was definitely worried about Dialga, but I just 2-0'd it and my opponent was never never able to get the uh, the Star Chronos going. So round nine, I have to play against Andrew Hedrick, who is on uh, Dialga again. And even though he goes first, he just starts Beldum Pass. And I'm like, all right, I'm in. So uh, I'm like, this is exactly how it's supposed to go. And then in, uh, in round nine, he dead draws game one, right? Because he just goes Beldum Pass. And then I think, it, like, turn two, he literally goes, uh, like, Beldum, and it has to magnetic lift. And so I just knock out the Beldum for game. Game two, he wins. Game three, I dead draw. So we didn't get any real games in because he dead drew game one. Uh, he went first and kind of stunted on me game two. And I went first and dead drew game three. So it was, it was not great. We didn't get any good games in. It's just kind of how it went. And I ended the day... Eight and one, which I felt very good about. Yo, thank you, uh, Holler, for the sub and the 32 months. I appreciate that. And that was just the first time that I played against Andrew Hedrick. Uh, I would play against him two more times. So at this point, I uh, I play against Justin again. 
who I had just played against in round eight. This is, I wake up, you know, get going here, day two. The last couple of day twos that I've played in, I started off round one of day two with a loss. So I was really intent on making sure that I woke up early, got myself caffeinated, and was feeling like ready to roll going into day two. Because sometimes uh, if you've played in these events, it's very, it's very normal and easy to get to round one of day two feeling sleepy. Um, because these events are exhausting, right? They just are, they're, they're exhausting. So I wanted to make sure that I was like really mentally like there, um, for round one of, of day two and it paid off. I played against Justin C again and I am able to 2-0 again. I mean, at this point I'm like, okay, so like the Dialga matchup's not that bad because I've 2 0 this guy twice. And I think that Justin, from what I heard, is Gabe's one of Gabe Smart's students. So like uh, he kind of was learning the Dialga deck from from Gabe, uh, who also played it. And uh, you know, Gabe and Andrew Hedrick are friends. So like you know, kind of in on the same exact list, right? So it's uh, there was a lot of Dialga at the top table. Like uh, if you were at table one, table two, your odds of playing Dialga were very high. They were right there. So played against Justin again and was able to 2-0. Oh, that felt great. Then I play against um, like a Turbo Lost Box deck, Michael Meal from Canada. This was definitely stressful because it's Lost Box. It's, it's like, uh, you know, the ancient box. Ancient box lost, but no, it's not that. It's the it's like the hands roaring moon hoopa Raikou lost box. It, it's that right that 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 combination of guys. It's it's got the darkness energy. It's got roaring moon. It's got hoopa. It's got uh, iron hands paradox box. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. So I was playing against parabox. Yeah, the pile. Um, this is a very stressful matchup to play. Uh, it is it is quite stressful because he wins the flip and he's able to get a... Uh, he wins the flip and he goes first, right? And he's setting up very strong. He gets seven cards in the loss zone on, uh, on turn two. And in kind of like a defensive... In a defensive, uh, you know, kind of response to playing against like a a loss, uh, what seems to be a loss box deck that is setting up very well. He goes, you know, turn one Comfy, uh, switch Comfy, Radiant Greninja has a big hand and is like, all right, pass. With two cards in the loss zone and two Comfy set up, you could be pretty confident that they can get to seven on turn two. All they need is a vacuum, a Colrus, and a couple more flower selectings, and it's and it's over, right? So, so what I do is I go uh, I go set up and I set up three Frigibacks backs and one Bidoof, right? Because if he just goes Radiant Greninja, my two Frigi, if I only get two Frigi, I just lose, right? Because he goes Radiant Greninja, my two Frigi, it's game over. So I go three Frigi, one Beeb, uh, one Bidoof. And I'm sitting on Beeberel and like almost nothing else in my hand, right? So like I don't even have a support. I've got like nothing. Um, so I need that Beeberel to like live so that I could keep playing. But I have to go for three uh, three Frigies and just hope that he leaves my Bidoof alone, right? It's got Bench Barrier after all, so it's probably fine. And then turn two, Colrises, he's grinding through his deck. He gets to seven in the law zone. And I'm like, all right, here comes the Radiant Greninja. And he doesn't go Radiant Greninja. He goes Prime Catcher, my Bidoof, and he hits it with Cramorant. And I'm like, uh, bruh. So like that was terrible. Uh, I pretty much lose on the spot because I just have to like pass, right? And I like I like rod the Badoof back in, get Badoof back down, and I and I have to pass. I'm like, you you're not gonna prime catcher again. Go ahead. And then he goes radiant Greninja two Frigies, and the game is pretty much over from there uh, because he was able to take three prizes before I was able to do anything. Game two. I go first. He's struggling to find Colris, and um, 
and I just go like turn two Radiant Greninja, uh, and then I'm able to transition into Iron Hands. I see that he's playing the, uh, um, I see that he's playing the Hoopa, but at this point I'm already initiating the trade. Yo, thanks Pedro, I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, since I initiated the two prize trade, I'm just able to win because if I'm the first player to take two prizes, it doesn't matter if he can knock out my two prizes because I'm the first one to take two prizes. So he was not able to, I don't think he was able to get Manaphy out early and I was able to go Radiant Greninja into uh, into like Iron Hands. He Hoopas my hands, but it doesn't matter because at that point I can knock out Hoopa and then go hands for game. So like very easy to go two, four, six if you're the first person to take two prizes. Then in game three, I'm I'm definitely nervous because I remember how badly game one went. But in game three, he starts Roaring Moon EX. So the fact that he opened Roaring Moon EX is huge for me because um, because that means that I have a guaranteed two prizer that I can take. And I can actually, I have a much easier time being the first player to take two prizes that way. So he's able to like switch out. He goes comfy, comfy, and like sets up just fine. He flower selects twice, right? I mean, he gets everything going the way he needs to get it going. So, uh, but that Roaring Moon is still there. So that's very good. And then uh, I start setting up and I realize that I prized a Friggy and I can't get three Friggy down, right? So unlike game one where I went, and keep in mind, he got to seven in the loss zone turn two going first game one. So, like, I remember that. That is very fresh in my mind. So, like, I know he can do it. And he's got two cards in the loss zone already, uh, game three going first. So, you know, I'm replaying game one through my mind, and I'm like, well, sometimes you just have to say that they don't have it because I prized a Friggy. So, I go set up two Badoof and two... Uh, I set up two Badoof and I set up two Friggies. And... I say pass, and I'm like, hope you don't have it. I think I have Radiant Greninja in the active. And then uh, he goes, uh, he goes, Colris, Flower Select, Flower Select. He gets to, he gets to like six in the loss zone. He's not quite at seven, right? And I'm like, all right, I think I cleared it. I think I'm good. And he decides to go Prime Catcher, Cram, knock out my Bidoof again. But this time, I've got a second Bidoof. So now I'm able to go hands, uh, hands the Cramorant. And that was like the nutso play. I have one Bieber L and I need to whip up hands knockout on this Cramorant. Cause I don't quite have prime catcher. Uh, I don't have the prime catcher play. The prime catcher is prized. So I cannot go, cause the easiest way to take two prizes would have been to prime catcher the Roaring Moon on the bench and knock it out with a Chen Pal. But my prize, my prime catcher is prized. So I don't have that option. So if I want to start the two, four, six trade, I have to go hands into the Cramorant. And I have, uh, I have like a Bibarel for four um, in order to, in order to get the play. I've got Radiant Greninja in the active spot again, and I've got three energy in my discard pile uh, because I, I haven't had Chen Pao out yet, right? So like, keep in mind, the energy's kind of light. Uh, I haven't had Chen Pao out yet. So I need to, off of my Beeb for four, I need to find a superior and a water energy. And if I get superior water, I'm able to retreat my Greninja. I have three water and a lightning in my discard pile, and I could go superior to the Iron Hands and Blamo take my two prizes. And uh, the first card off the Bibarel for four is the superior. And I'm like, I'm so in, let's go. And then I draw, not it. Draw, not it. Draw, not it. And the last card off the Bibarel is the water energy. I slam it down, uh, super cold onto the Greninja, retreat to my iron hands. And that like that moment, I remember it so vividly in my mind because that moment defined this game and also like defined a lot of my day two run. Like actually being able to rip that hands knockout on the Cramorant in that moment, that sets the pace for this entire series because now he has to respond with Hoopa to my hands, right? So he responds with Hoopa EX to my hands. I respond with Chen Pao to the Hoopa. And then he responds by taking two prizes, knocking out the Chen Pao. And then I respond by taking two prizes for game. So like, that's how it went. 
and I was able to beat the Lost Box deck. But it all came down to the fact that he didn't get the turn two Radiant Greninja going first, and I was able to get the turn two Iron Hands going second. So, I mean, you could see, you're literally, you're walking on a razor's edge, right? You're walking on a razor's edge in these kinds of matchups, and it really is just like, how strong was your turn one, turn two? If your turn one, turn two was like, uh, you know, if it was like top tier, then you're gonna be you're gonna be cruising. If it was slow, if both players are having slow starts, you can kind of get some really interesting games. But it definitely does feel a little bit like it's a stunt or get stunted on format. Uh, kind of had those moments pop up a lot where you're either the one stunting on your opponent or you're the one getting stunted on. There were, I'd say, a few like good quality close games, but a lot of them were like stunt or get stunted on. Hundred percent. Benny, what's your question? Hello, welcome to the stream. Thanks for being here. So I'm able to beat Lost Box round 11. And then round 12, I play against Andrew Hedrick again. And I'm like, okay, this is the second time we've played. The first time, uh, you know, he dead drew game one. Uh, he went first game two and one, and I dead drew game three. So I'm looking forward to like, getting back after it. I'm able to go first, and in game one, I Radiant Greninja to Beldums and just win. He goes first game two, and he sets up well, and he just wins. In game three, um, I am uh, I'm able to take the first two prizes, and we're trading, and we get to the end of the game, and I'm setting up a board state where, uh, I'm setting up a board state where I'm ahead on prizes by a lot, and I have to do the thing where like he takes a knockout on my Chen Pao and then I'm able to, um, you know, he takes a knockout on my Chen Pao. I'm able to like uh, go iron hands and I'm able to win. Uh, but he's so far behind in the prize trade that he is in a position where if he just says pass, I can't win because I have four prizes left to take and I like won't be able to take them or something like that. It, it's like, cause I'm board locked, right? So like, uh, yeah, so like the situation is this, uh, cause I have four prizes left to take. He's got one Diago V-Star in play, right? So I'm like, okay, I can win in two turns in time uh, because I can knock out the Diago V-Star he, or he takes a knockout, I knock out the Diago V-Star and then I hands for game, something like that. Um, but uh, since I am board locked though, so like if he just says pass, I could chase down the Diago V-Star and then he could say pass again and then I can't actually get Iron Hands into play because uh, he just passed twice, right? So like he didn't actually take a knockout, didn't free up the board, sp board space for me. And it's like, you don't wanna jam your bench, but you have to, right? Thank you, Aerosol Long for the, uh, for the sub, I appreciate it. You have to jam your bench because like I said, Especially against Dialga, you have to always have two Baxcalibur. You have to always have two Bibarel. That's exactly how you lose. And if you watch the finals of Indianapolis, you saw that is exactly how Ji Shen lost because he only had one Bibarel. So even though I would have liked to uh, had the have the uh, the bench spot open, you cannot have the bench spot open because you have to have two Baxcalibur outs. You have to have two Bibarel outs, pretty much at all times. So, uh, you know, combined with Radiant Greninja, which obviously Radiant Greninja's in play, and then combined with my attacker Chen Pao, who's obviously there to knock out the Dialgas, uh, we get into a situation where he's basically able to finesse his way into a tie. He's got no way of winning the set. Like, I am going to win game three. If time goes on infinitely, he cannot win. I've got it, right? I've got it down. Um, but... Uh, that's not the way the game works. The game is 50 minutes, best of three. So, um, so yeah, it is, uh, it is tough. So yeah, we end up tying, um, and, uh, he's able to finesse his way into the tie. So we just kind of take that and move on. At this point, I know that I need four wins in day two in order to have a, uh, in order to have a shot at top eight. 36 match points was the bubble in Orlando. 
So I know that it's going to be close at 36. I would obviously like to get to 37, but that's asking a lot because 36 match points is already really hard to get. So, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really hard to get. And also, I know my opponent wasn't going to be able to double gust in game three because he had to he had to research away two boss on the first turn of the game. So like, I knew that that wasn't happening. Um, I, I knew he had limited amounts of boss left in the deck. Uh, so it was a uh, it was a close one. But given infinite time, I would have won game three there. So at that point, I'm feeling pretty good about it because I'm like, okay, I like I had Andrew Hedrick in a situation where like. I had the killing blow lined up, but we ran out of time, right? And at this point, I had already beaten Justin with Dialga twice, 2-0 both times. So like I had a close loss to Andrew Hedrick where I took a game off him in day one, and then I beat Justin twice, 2-0, and then I have another game versus Andrew Hedrick where I'm about to beat him, right? And... uh and time is called. So like, so I'm like, I can I can legitimately win this thing. Uh, it's possible. Like, it's definitely possible. Like, the stars could align. I could win this event um, because I can beat Dialga. I know how to beat it. I just have to, things just, but things do have to go right, right? Like, I do have to have some things go right. But it it is possible at this point, and it feels like it's possible. So at this point, the tie against Andrew Hedrick I'm like, okay, that's fine. Um, it's fine that I tied against Andrew Hedrick because I'm like, I know that 37 match points is guaranteed. So if I can go 4-1-1 uh, after an eight-win start, then I'll be at 37 match points. Um, so that extra tie, it's, it's fine. I'm like, that just will be an ID that I can't make later. Then I get to pair it against Reagan Retzloff. And I win the flip. He's playing Bax Caliber. I compliment him on his list because I have taken a lot of inspiration from Reagan's lists uh, for the Chen Pao deck, and I very much admire his deck building skills. So he is a he's a very good player, um, and I go first. So I Reagan is a very good player, and he knows every single out possible to coming out of a game with the best outcome. He knows, and he's just a very good competitor. Um. I think that Reagan kind of masterfully put himself in a situation uh, that this was going to potentially be a tie from the onset of the game. And I'll I'll explain why. So, like, game one, I go first. I get the turn two Radiant Greninja going first. And he doesn't scoop, which is unlike any other Chen Pao player that I've played so far. Like, not just that he didn't scoop. Like, he he played out game one until the final prize was taken. Right. Even though his win percentage, his win percentage potential in game one was probably 2%. Right. I mean, I had, I had everything. I had a huge hand. I had everything, but he went through and he went for his win condition. So like he had a win condition where like maybe he could have pulled a, maybe he could have pulled out a, a win if he knocks out my only Bax Caliber and somehow I don't have a backup Bax Caliber with like rods and rare candies and like a massive hand, right? Like, you know, so he like builds up manual attachments and like, and prime catches my Bax Caliber and knocks it out. And I'm like, I have rare candy, uh, you know, rare candy Bax Caliber retrieval, it's GG's, right? And he's like, okay. Um, so he plays out the entire game one, even though he's getting dominated, right? Like, I mean, it, it was like a, he maybe took two prizes that game. Um, so he played out the entire game to a, uh, to a loss, right? Which was like interesting because he's the only Chen Pao player I played against who did that. And then, um, game two, I scoop game two on like turn two or three, right? He goes first, he gets the turn two Chen Pao knockout on my Chen Pao. He doesn't go turn two Radiant Greninja to Fridges. If he does that, I just scoop. But he doesn't get that. So he gets turn two Chen Pao knockout on my Chen Pao. So I can still play the game. So I play a turn or two, and then I scoop it up, right? As uh, as we do. Then, as we're shuffling up for game three, I know we have we have about eight minutes left um, to win. Uh, we have eight minutes left to do game three, right? And... 
And I'm like, this is enough time because all I have to do is take two prizes before turns are called. And then I can go hands, hands, or I could go 10 pound knockout, 10 pound, then hands. Like all you need to do when you're playing a 50 minute best of three in order to win, all you have to do, especially with Chen Pao, all you have to do is get into turns where you have two turns left to play and four prizes, like obviously. Because like I said, Chen Pao is a deck where you can knock out any two prizer with a two prizer and you can knock out just about any single prizer with iron hands. So you have complete control over the game. All you have to do is get to the time limit with four prizes remaining and you win. So both Reagan and I are very aware of this. <laughs> we, we are both incredibly aware of this, which is why I, I, I scoop up game two very quickly uh, and, and start to get going on game three. But game one took so long because he never scooped. And I think that that was intentional, right? Um, which is just smart. I mean, obviously, it's just smart play from his part. So like, but it was it was tough, right? So in game three, I set up first, I knock out, uh, I go, he only sets up one Fridgy Backs. His board state is Radiant Greninja, Fridgy Backs, and Bidoof. That's the board state. I go turn two Prime Catcher, Bidoof, Radiant Greninja, both uh, the Bidoof and the Fridgy. Okay? I notice off of my first Prime... I noticed off of my first deck search that I have prized the lightning energy. Uh, thank you, Greg Copter, for that prime sub. Thank you. I noticed off the deck search that I have prized my lightning energy, right? So I'm hoping that I pull it here off these two prizes. So I knock out both uh, both Bidoof and Fridgy with the Prime Catcher Radiant Greninja play. And I'm playing fast because I, I know the stakes. So, like, I have to keep going. I have to go, I have to go, I have to go, I have to go. But uh, Bax Caliber is a deck that is, like, very much... You can do a million game actions with the Bax Caliber deck. In fact, you can you can take a five-minute turn easy with a Bax Caliber deck. It is one of the easiest things you can do because every single Nest Ball, every single Buddy Buddy Poffin, every single game action, there are a million different game actions that you can do. So his next turn, he probably he probably plays like a three, three, four minute turn. Um uh, it's probably like a three minute turn. Uh he gets down another Fridgy and uh and he gets down um Iron Bundle. So this is his board that he sets up. after like playing a whole bunch of cards and doing a bunch of stuff. Um thank you, Jamie, for the prime sub. I appreciate it. Uh, he passes with Radiant Greninja in the active, uh, one Fridgy on the bench, and Iron Bundle on the bench. And then says, you're go. And then, at this point, he knows that I have prized my lightning energy. Because the optimal play, and I know, we both know time's winding down. I probably have three minutes left on the clock. And he knows that my lightning energy is prized, uh, I want to say it's less than three minutes on the clock. I think I have like, I have like legitimately, uh, I, I legitimately, I think I have 90 seconds, right? Because he's able to eat, he's able to eat a lot of the clock on his turn and I'm playing very fast, but like he, he's not playing, he's just doing the correct thing to do in this situation, which is to just play for the tie. But it's very, it's, it's, there's a lot of nuance to it. So like, so he sets up his board as Greninja in the active, Fridgy on the bench, and uh, and the uh, Iron Bundle. He knows that my Lightning Energy is prized because the optimal play for me this turn is to go Iron Hands, knock out the Greninja, and then I go to two prizes left, and he can't win. Um, because he either brings up Chen Pao to knock up my Iron Hands, and then I go Chen Pao, knock out his uh, Chen Pao, uh, or he puts up another single prizer, and I knock it out for game. So... Um, I can't do that though because my lightning energy is priced. So my best play is I have to go as lightning fast as I can and I go Radiant Greninja, hit the Radiant Greninja for 90, snipe the Fridgy for 90, hope that I pull the lightning energy, right? And I miss it again. So then uh, he takes another turn and he gets out uh, he gets out like it's, it's just the Radiant Greninja and the uh, and the the 
the bundle is all he has, right? And he ends up being turn zero. And I've got three prizes left to take. And uh, he just passes with Radiant Greninja bundle. After doing some stuff, he like he passes with Radiant Greninja bundle, right? So then I'm able to Radiant Greninja again. Uh, and I take one more prize because he's turned zero. So like I pretty much, I do my thing and there's no time left on the clock basically when I attack. And then he knows that he's going to be turn zero because he's got another minute or so. I mean, like he knows that his turn is not going to conclude before time's called. So like he's going to be turn zero. So he doesn't bench any other Pokemon and all he does, and I, he knows I've got three prizes left to take and he's got six. I mean, he's got all of them and I've got three prizes left to take. And he knows my lightning's prize because I didn't attack with iron hands on the turn that I should have. So then, um, so then he just keeps the Radiant Greninja in the active. He keeps Iron Bundle on the bench. And uh, and he says pass, right? And then, uh, so he's turn zero. I'm turn one. I go Radiant Greninja again, and I hit the Greninja for knockout, and I put 90 on the bundle. Then he's turn two, right? So I'm going to get one more turn. And if I pull the Lightning Energy off of my final three prizes, I win because I'll be able to attack with Iron Hands. But I don't. The Lightning Energy ends up being in my final two prizes, which is sad. So then, uh, he's got, he's got a, uh, he's got an Iron Bundle with 90 damage on it in the active spot. And what he does is he rods the Radiant Greninja back into the deck. Uh, he benches the Radiant Greninja. He retreats bundle into Radiant Greninja. He uses the bundle to heal the 90 damage off it and discard it. He rods the bundle back into the deck and he puts the bundle back down and pass. So his board is clean Greninja, clean bundle, pass. And I'm turn three of time. I have two prizes left to take and my lightning energy is in my bottom two prizes. So that was it. And I can't do it, right? Because I prized my lightning. And he knew I prized my lightning. Because I, like I said, I would have attacked with the Iron Hands on the correct turn. And this is all happening like, like this, right? Because, uh, because like I said, we had eight minutes left to conclude game three. Only eight minutes. I mean, so like every, like we're firing off very fast until time is called. And he's able to, he was able to piece this together. So it's like he... I want to say, yo, thank you, uh, yeah, thank you, Jamie, for the Prime sub. Thank you, Greg Copter. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Aerosol Long. I want to say that what I th what I think Reagan's done, and Reagan is like a wizard at this game. I mean, he's absolutely incredible. He's he is very, very, very good. What I think that Reagan was doing is that in game one. He didn't scoop game one of the Chen Pao mirror where I went first because he knew that uh, he knew that there was a possible outcome of a loss, right? Like the, a high a higher percentage possible outcome of uh, of a loss, and uh, and so he lets he lets me win game one, you know, going through all the motions. And just lets it eat up 30, 30 something minutes of the clock. Uh, letting it go all the way down. He knows he'll win game two, right? Because he's going first. So he does everything to try and win game one. And he knows he can't do it. But he never scoops. And then game two, he knows he'll win because he's going first. Just like I won game one going first. So he wins game one going first. And I scoop pretty quick. I want to say I scoop on like turn three. So like I scoop pretty quick. And then in game three... He's like, okay, uh, you know, he gives himself a chance where if I brick, he can still have enough time to win, right? But since I didn't brick, he's like, now he's put himself in a situation where he can potentially squeak out a tie because he never scooped game one, right? So it's like, he put himself in this situation where there was a possibility for the outcome of a tie by never scooping game one, even though it was clear he was going to lose, right? So like, so that, I mean, that's just like, that's just gaming right there. I mean, that's just, that's, what do they call that? 
what it's like you're gaming the game. I mean, that's just like that's yeah, that's that's nuts. It's that it's gamesmanship to it's like yeah, it's gamesmanship to it's like to it's to it's like final level, you know, finest level. Yeah, it was definitely it was gamesmanship for sure. And there's not there's nothing wrong with it. It's completely legal, right? But like you could see how he's using every single ounce of like the time and using every single ounce of like his win cons. Like so in order for this to work out, he needed uh he needed my lightning to be prized. But it was, you know? Yeah. So like it was uh I mean, it was masterfully done by Reagan, but there was almost nothing I could do about it. I think, you know, I could tell myself maybe if I scooped a turn earlier, but then it's like, you know, maybe Reagan's able to stretch some things out. So, like, but it's like, yeah, it was going to be very hard. Without that lightning energy, it was going to be very hard. Yeah. To, to win it. If, since he is just like, putting down single prizers that can't be Radiant greninja right? Yeah, just literally don't even, like, I could have scooped, I could have scooped, like, like, instantaneously game two, right? I did hear that Reagan, uh, I did hear that Reagan had the same exact thing happen to him on stream, though, with, with Moffat, right? Us in the Pokemon community, we've talked about this where you don't even set up for game two. You're like, all right, I'll scoop game two, go first game three, right? Like we've talked about how funny that would be, but it's actually a situation where that that is the actual, like probably correct thing to do, right? So he should have won versus Moffat and I should have won versus Reagan. We see how, I mean, the, the clock is certainly like all part of the tournament, right? But like, Reagan had not taken a prize versus me, and there was no way for him to take a prize. Right. Then you brick game three. So that's why it's like, I want to start game two, because it's like, there's a possibility that Reagan bricks game two, right? And he almost did. Reagan almost, wh he almost whiffed the turn two attack. It was so close. So, uh, I mean, Reagan's incredibly so good at this game, though. So he's just, I mean, he, it's kind of like, you see that this, this is what happens with Tord too. I mean, Tord, Tord just is like using perfect gamesmanship to like get himself out of games as well, right? It's, I mean, it's the, it's like, this stuff's not against the rules. You're just using the rules to your advantage. That's called gamesmanship. It's not against the rules. You're just using the rules to your advantage. So it's like that kind of stuff is very normal and it happens. It happens in all competitive games. But the clock was like a real beast in this event and very much changed the outcome of a lot of rounds, right? Um, as we saw, my tie against Andrew Hedrick, had that gone out infinitely, I would have won. My tie against Reagan Retzloff, if that had gone out infinitely, I would have won. So at this point, I'm feeling pretty I'm feeling pretty bad about those back-to-back -back ties because both of them were like if I get one more turn I win. And it was yeah and there was no slow play. Reagan was not slow playing. No 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 no. Don't think for a second that Reagan was slow playing. He was not. And I'm not absolutely not. No 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 no. That's not how it went. But as someone who who is experiencing you know, all of this, I want you guys to know, like, that this is how things go down, right? And for, I want you all to be very aware of how important playing the clock is at the top level of the Pokemon TCG. Clock awareness and manipulation is happening all the time. So, uh, all, all the time, all the time. It's happening all the time. So I'm feeling very bad uh, about these back-to-back -back ties because in in both of these, I I win if I uh, in both of these I win if if time goes out infinitely. But that's not how the game is structured. It's 50 minutes best of three, and everybody knows that going into their sets. So uh, 
You know, and I guess against Reagan, like technically, if I had known that I was going to draw the nuts in game three and known that he was going to get a turn two attack in game two, but like you don't know those things, right? You don't know those things. So like you can't like, so I scooped as, I scooped as fast as I could have, as fast as I, I think like, but it's hard looking back. You're like, man. So, uh, like I said, um, going into day two, I knew I needed to win four, right? In order to get to 36 points, um, I needed to win four. Um, and in order to get to 37, I had to win four and tie one. So at this point, I'm very, I'm very frustrated about the tie with Reagan um, because I was so close to winning. He had no chance of taking any prizes, right? I mean, it was, it was absolute demol demolishing. There was, there was nothing he could do about it. Right. And I'm like, okay, so, um, and these two ties basically are losses at this point, unless I get a third tie and I have pretty much, uh, I have no chance to get to 37 now. So that's stressing me out. Unless I win two more. I could go 402 day two. So I could get to 37 if I literally am like, if I win out, right? So I'm like, I'm kind of frustrated for sure. And then I get paired into Pidgeot control. And you can imagine at this point, tying back to back rounds where I'm like one turn away from winning. And then... Getting paired and my opponent goes, all right, turn one, Snorlax, your go, bud. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> my, my, my freaking, my eyes are about to pop out of my skull, right? I'm pretty sure they were all playing this list. This looks like exactly what, what Ryan was playing right here so um so yeah i don't i had not played uh i had not played a single game with bax caliber against this deck i didn't even know what was in this list i was winging it <laughs> I I I was winging it, man. Thank you, Will R N Daniel, for the prime sub. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. I was figuring it out uh, as I went. So I open a pretty decent hand, and I open Frigibax in the active, and I open my prime catcher, and I open Badoof and Bibarel. Um Game one going first. I open Friggy. He opens uh, Snorlax and Rotom V, right? He he opens Rotom V and attaches Skateboard to it and retreats to Snorlax. That's his turn one going first, right? So I'm like, huh. I don't even know what I'm like up against. I don't know if it's like Pidgeyzard. I don't know if it's like... Uh, I don't know if it's quad lax. Like, I really don't know. So at this point, I kind of just like, am like, I'm just going to like suss out what you're doing. And I just like attach a water to my Friggy and pass. <laughs> like, I, I'm like, because you're kind of like, I'm like, I'm sitting on a lot. I got like prime catcher. I got like, I got like a lot of stuff in my hand, right? I got like, a, I got juice in my hand. I got rare candy backs caliber in my hands and I've got Bidoof Bibarel in my hand and like a water, right? So I'm like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pass, right? So I pass and then he puts down Pidgey, right? And I'm like, all right, so it's Pidgey. And at that point I'm like, all right, it's Pidgey Zard. So I have to set up. So I bench Bidoof, I rare candy into Chen Pao and I pass again. Uh, or I rare candy into Bax Caliber and I pass again. Uh, he sets up like one more turn and uh, doesn't airy me yet, which is like perfect. So then, um, so then I top deck a, a Chen Pao and I'm able to evolve into into 
Bieber L, bench Chen Pao, prime catcher up the Pidgey, and I just knock out the Pidgey because I know I'm guaranteed to be able to get some water off Shivery Chill. I don't have guaranteed knockout on Rotom, but frankly, I don't even care about the Rotom because I just want to get this. I want to get this stinking prime catcher out of my hand so that he can't area it. So like, I know I have to do that. So I, uh, I, I prime catcher, I beeb, I knock out the Pidgey. And in our entire set, he is never able to get Pidgeot EX out. That's how much I was able to like chase down those Pidgeys. So I prime catcher up the Pidgey and I knock it out. Then he uh, bosses up my my Bibarel and locks it with Snorlax and uses uh, uses Rotom again. And this is how I was able to win. You win this matchup by using you just use your freaking uh, your guy, dude. You just use your your bundler. I was able to bundle him like crazy. It was nuts. So like, uh, I I think I played it like like perfectly. Honestly, I any time I suspected that he would airy, I would like superior for energy back into my hand and just kind of keep the energy out. And then uh, no, I never attacked for I never attacked with Bibrail. So the way I was able to stay out of it is that since they're always like. Since they're always trying to set up stuff on the bench, you basically just go, all right, you've got my B-Barrel active, all right, I bench bundle, bundle, right? And then they push up something else, because they're only playing like one Snorlax, so they push up something else, and then you go, okay, retreat b uh, attack whatever you have in the active, right? And so like, they can't really play around that. You just like, uh, you just keep bundling. And then you rod the bundle back in every time. And I would do things like I would be Burrell for five, play my hand out and leave myself with like a two card hand. Right. And since I was able to keep Pidgeot out of play, he wasn't able, like there were a couple turns where like there was like a turn here and there where he would like hit the prime. He would miss the prime catcher. Right. If and then if my opponent's got Mawile on the active, I mean, then you have to try and go for like, uh, you have to try and take knockouts with Bibarel. But then if they put the cape on the Mawile, but then it's like, okay, you have a potential out of like Prime Catcher. You could Silene Prime Catcher, right? But yeah, the version of of that I played against, I was able to just bundle every turn. So and since I was able to chase down the Pidgey with Prime Catcher, uh, both games. My opponent never got Pidgeot into play. Uh, game two, he used Call for Family, and uh, I was able to. Uh... Oh, he prized Lax. I mean, yeah, I mean, game two was not going well for him either. Um, I was able. He was able to eventually get the Lax out of the prizes with, uh, I think, a Suey and Heavy Ball or something. But, uh, but yeah, I mean. I ended up just getting there with Iron Bundle. Every time I needed to put Iron Bundle into play, I was able to like rot it. I kept my hand small, was able to be Burrell, then play the cards out of my hand, right? And then like I never got I never got aried either. Like I just played the item. Like when I saw the items, I played them. And then I kept my hand small. And then I'd be Burrell. And then I'd see the items. I'd play them, right? Uh and uh basically by being like fast and aggressive, I was able to just kind of like take the key knockouts that I needed to take out. He never really set up either game. Um, he, you know, had to rely on Rotom to draw cards and never got Pidgeot out. Uh, he tried to go for the Wigglytuff a couple of times, and then uh, I was able to chase that down too. With like, it, in game two, he was trying to go for the Radiant Greninja or for the Wigglytuff, and I think I was able to like Radiant Greninja it uh, to knock it out. I didn't get Radiant Greninja out in game one because it's a liability, obviously. Uh, I was just attacking with Chen Pao and, uh, and Bax Calibur if I needed to. But in game two, I did put the Radiant Greninja down because I felt like I needed it and was using that. And uh, at the end of the game, he tried to... Uh, at the end of the game, he he was like trying to like lock my... my uh, he had no bench Pokemon, right? Because I'd, I'd killed them all. And he was trying to lock my Radiant Greninja in the active because he couldn't find Countercatcher. He was, like, missing Countercatcher. Well, because he didn't have Pidgeot. He didn't have uh, Rotom anymore because I knocked those guys out. So all he had was a Hero's Cape on, on like, uh, 
you know, Snorlax and was just like top decking and trying to like get things going. But I had Radiant Greninja stuck in the active and I just eventually was able to go smack, 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 uh, you know, with just hitting the, uh, and I wasn't playing supporters. I was like kind of just draw passing and would like, you know, I top deck into a superior play at smack, you know, stuff like that. So just with some heads up play, I was able to get there and uh, I did win the match 2-0. Uh, you could see that, like, you know, I won like a a thirty, I won like a thirty minute game one, like it was a thirty five minute game one, something like that, thirty thirty five minute game one, and then game two, um, you know, he's playing very fast, uh, obviously trying to get through it, uh, but I end up winning and taking all six prizes in game two as well. So like it, it just was a tough outing for uh for Ryan there in that uh, in that best of three. And then at this point, I'm like, I, I'm breathing like a deep sigh of relief. I am so thankful I was finally able to get another win after going, uh, you know, round 10 win, round 11 win, round 12 and 13, kind of heartbreaking ties. And then finally, with another win, I'm at a point where I'm at, at very least, I am in a win and in for top eight. Looking at the results from Orlando, um, I think two 36-point finishers bubbled out of top eight. Riley was texting me and said that top eight was going to be a graveyard or that 36 match points was going to be a graveyard in top eight. So I was feeling really nervous. Yeah, Riley said 36 match points was going to be a total graveyard, and I didn't really know what to think about it. I didn't really know if I could ID to go to 36. I didn't know how many bubbles there were going to be. Um, I was I was feeling pretty bad about it. Uh, so I was thinking, going into it, I was like, I probably have to, um, I, I probably have to play. Um, a graveyard, as in, uh, was thinking there would probably be three bubbles. Yeah, like three thirty. We were thinking there could be three thirty sixes that miss. Which is like, I mean, 336. You don't want to ID and be one of the three people that misses top eight, right? That's horrible. And then we also didn't know the math as to like where 35. So like if you end at 35, like are you at least guaranteed top 16? Because the fall off is like nuts. Because if you if you end up finishing like 17th place or something, then... Uh, then you only get $1,000, right? Top 16 is $2,000. Top eight is $3,000. And uh, and top 32 is $1,000. So you could literally be making multiple thousand dollar mistakes in one round, right? So there's a lot of pressure to like, for players to kind of figure out what's, uh, uh, what to do here. And... Uh, and from what I'm gathering from Riley, he's saying that I have to play. Uh, from what I'm gathering from Natalie, she's saying that, uh, that you know, uh, I might be okay with an ID. But we kind of have to see how things shake out, right? Because resistances are kind of all over the place and, and they can change a lot in the final round as well. And a lot of it depends on how the final round goes. So... I get paired up against Lucas. Uh, Lucas is a very good Chen Pao player from Canada. And we're both on Chen Pao, right? So I go over to my table and Lucas offers the ID. He says, yo, man, if you want to ID, uh, I'm down. I'm like, you're not worried about like bubbling out? What if we, what if we bubble out, right? And he's like, to be honest, uh, you know, our resistance should be pretty good, uh, you know, and um, he's like, I'd rather take a, he's like, this matchup is a coin flip anyway, right? Because the player who goes first is so heavily advantaged. He's like, I'd rather do the coin flip on resistance and guarantee myself a top placement with $2,000, right? Like, because you, you guarantee, guarantee your top 16 placement, right? He's like, I'd rather the coin flip come down to resistance than the coin flip come down 
to like me being at 35 and having a lower placement or whatever. And he's like, and I feel pretty confident about our resistance since both of us are going to boost our own resistances anyway. And I'm like, you know what? That makes sense because the Chen Pao mirror is a crapshoot anyway, right? So I'm like, all right, that adds up. And I would later learn that Lucas also ID'd his previous round because he played against Chen Pao too. So Lucas was at 34 match points and he went ID his, he played against back-to-back, back-to-back backs calibers in round, round 14 and 15. And he tried to double ID his way into top eight. So he offered the ID to his round 14 opponent. Uh, and then he offered the round the ID to his basically uh, to his final opponent. And everybody else at the top was IDing as well. So table one was IDing, table two was IDing, and we were table three. And uh, and he offered the ID. So like I was like, eh, you know, whatever. Sure. I'm burnt out. I'm ready to like relax a little bit. That's that's fine. And at this at this way, I'm guaranteed two thousand dollars, and I think I have like a good chance of making. You know, I hadn't actually lost yet in day two, right? Like I won three. I played against a lot of players who were doing really well. I was confident that uh, that my resistance was gonna be was gonna be good enough to get me into top eight because of how many uh, players that I had played against who were doing well. So kind of just like looking around, I was like, all my opponents that I've had today seem to be having very successful days. And if you look at my opponent's results, I mean, like, Justin didn't end up doing too good. He finished at 29 match points. But Michael ended up with 34 match points. I mean, Andrew Hedrick ended up with 45 match points. Reagan ended up with 34 match points. Ryan Antonucci ended up with 34 match points. Lucas ended up with 36 match points. So you could see, like, my day two, like, dude, the opponents that I played day two, and those are your tiebreakers, right? Like that, so that's, it's like, how how good did your opponents end up doing? Those are your tiebreakers. So that's why I'm talking about that. So yeah, all of my opponents in day two ended up like top 32 or better. Almost all of them, except for Justin. So like, that's, I, that's how I made top eight. All my opponents were insane. They all did great. So I, I took the ID, you know, Lucas offered it. And then, uh, I don't know. How do you look at the, uh, how do you look at the standings? Can you look at like all the standings? Do they have that anywhere? On Limitless now? I think it's only top eight, right? Oh, no, here we go. Yep. Excellent. And then Lucas. Sorry, Lucas. Lucas was the one player, the only player at 36 match points who ended up bubbling out of top eight. So RIP Lucas. I'm sorry that 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 did not end up buffing out for you, but I very much appreciate you offering the ID with me. So that was that was sick. I don't feel so bad because it was his idea. <laughs> it was his idea. It was totally his. I was I was very ready to go in and play. Um but Lucas kind of talked me into IDing. So I was like, I was like, that's cool. Not in any bad kind of way, but he's like, he's like, you know, I think it'll be fine. And I'm like, all right, cool. Let's go. He's like, if you're he's like, if you're into it, I'm into it. That's fine. And I'm like, you know what? That sounds pretty good. So it was uh it was definitely his idea, and uh, I do feel bad for him though. So that was um, that was unfortunate. He did bubble out of uh, of top eight just barely. So he made top eight at the second largest regional championship ever, which was pretty hype. Uh, I've already kind of recounted my matchup with Andrew Hedrick. Obviously, it went terribly. If you watched it on stream, my uh, my deck just spontaneously combusted on me, pretty much uh, just, it was the absolute worst that my deck had functioned the entire tournament. I mean, just nothing went right. Everything was terrible. I didn't draw the combo I needed in game one to take the convincing double beldum knockouts. 
I had prized two superiors, which made that combo, and three water energy, which made that combo much more difficult to get. And then uh, in game two, I got Ionode into a dead hand. I opened three Irida going first in game two, right? Going first, three Irida. And then I have I set up, you know, Bidoof, Friggy, pass. And then my opponent Ionos those all to the bottom of the deck, and I dead draw. Because there we go. So it was just it was just it was it was terrible. Yeah, it was just horrible. At that point, I was tilted. Like after missing game one and getting Ionoed into a dead hand game two, I was just so tilted. I was I was ready to scoop, but I was like, I'm on stream. I was ready to scoop. I was I was I it, mentally I was like, it's it's scoop time. But like I wasn't gonna I was like, I'm on stream. I'll at least let you do the thing. You know what I mean? Like people are watching, you know, like the broadcasters gotta fill airtime. I'll sit here and let you star Kronos, like sure. But it, it, you know it's over, right? So like I'm kind of just going through the motions. It was uh it was it was terrible. But uh but you know, I'd made it along a long ways and I was very proud of how I played throughout the weekend. I felt like I was I was really like dialed in and and playing really well. I felt like I had a lineup of of a lot of really talented opponents that I had the privilege of playing against this weekend as well. And it was my first time ever taking Chen Pao to a major event. Uh, it's my first time ever playing it. And we top eight it. So, I mean, that's just, uh, that just feels great. So, I'm really, really proud of how the weekend went. I mean, the 2006 tournament win was super cool. And then backing it up with a top eight finish at the second largest regional ever. I mean, 2,342 players to get to finish seventh place. I mean, just wonderful. And the fact that they have bumped that prize money up now to $3,000 for a top eight finish. Uh, the old prizing was 750. So like last year for top eighting a regional, you got $750. Now you get three grand. So like, heck yeah, that, uh, that rocks. I think, uh, I mean like leading up to the event, you could certainly tell that I was, uh, you could certainly tell that I was I was like trying to dial in with Chen Pao. I mean, I was really trying to like kind of learn the routes and I was really trying to kind of figure out how the deck worked and all of that. And I mean, it's just kind of like proof of concept, right? If you put your time in with the deck that's going to be the right deck for the tournament. And I think like... uh. I, and I think I did. I put my time in with Chen Pao, and I think Chen Pao was a great call for this event, right? And that paid off. So obviously, you need a lot of other things to go right um, in order to put yourself in a top eight, you know, contention. It is, I mean, there there is like zero room for error. Had, if what happened in my top eight match happened at any other crucial point along the way, then I might not have made top eight. And that's so crazy. I mean, 36 match points. Dude, my record was... My record was what? I, I went into top eight at 11, 1, and 3. 11, 1, and 3, bro. I'm not kidding. Yeah, Logan Davis, I'm not kidding when I say that I, I suck at playing live. Like, for sure. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm much better at playing in paper because the game, there's some, I'm very tactile. I'm a very tactile person. The the game, there's a certain amount of disconnect that happens when I, when I'm like playing on, on the digital client. I really am not a, I'm not a fan, but like, you know, it just is what it is. It's a good resource. But uh, managing my resources, like being aware of where things are uh, in my discard pile, in my prizes, you know, it, it's very easy for me to, to like remember where things are, you know, in my deck. Um, it's very easy for me to keep track of all of that when it's all right in front of me 
in paper. Uh, but online, uh, there's a certain disconnect that happens for me, and it's it's much more difficult. No, I don't have ADHD, Jamie. I don't. I don't. I just, uh, uh, just you know, I, I I work better with tactile things. Exactly. You force your brain to adapt the cruddy live UI while on paper I do whatever's comfortable for managing my and that that almost is like that's a significant chunk of it right there, right? Is that like my brain hates the way that live is laid out. So like you know. So like that's just going to even subconsciously that's going to like Oh, and Logan Davis, I I appreciate that. No, I didn't take that as an insult in any kind of way. No, I know I know that my play is is tighter in person. I mean, it sounds like an excuse, but like, it is. <laughs> Do I not shuffle cards while playing live? Yes, but those cards have no connection to the actual game. So yeah, I'm very proud of how how the weekend ended up. Uh, honestly, the 06 event, uh, like both of them were just so cool, right? Both events were just so cool. Everything was so sick. Uh, you know, playing in the 06 event, getting to kind of like, man, I was riffling my drag trode deck, dude. Like I was, it was fun, man. <laughs> it was fun. It felt like I was able to take like the hot rod out of the garage for like a, a drive on a nice summer day. That's what it felt like. It felt like the car, like, you know, my project car that I'd had in the garage for years, I was able to finally take it out and take it for a spin. It was beautiful. Yeah, top down on the old drag trode. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, 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 for sure. Sabah House describing Moffat as doing a masterclass of taking a five minute turn. <laughs> Tell me Ryan Sable House did not actually say that. <laughs> bro, he did not roast him like that, bro. That was verbatim. <laughs> <sighs> yeah that's that's tough that's wild that is wild but yeah everything everything was amazing i mean this was just such a such a sick event uh the 06 event was so hype um my lbs finals in the 06 event it was like uh the you know because they did we did best of three for top four and finals. So like, it really felt like I got to kind of experience the tournament atmosphere for the 2006. And, uh, you know, my 2006 finals opponent was like, was, was playing really tight as well. They had a really cool Lugia Blastoise deck. Uh, I guess, yeah, really cool Lugia Blastoise deck. They had this Reggie Rocky accident, which was really cool. And they were using that to hit my Sneasels for weakness. But, uh, the lights were like literally going out as our as our finals games were concluding. Like we stayed the the hall was supposed to close at eight, and I think we wrapped up at like eight thirty. So like the lights were dimming, you know, everything was starting to get shut down. It was sick to have everybody kind of stay there and let us finish the event, though. That was really cool. Did I have the thickest glasses in the whole building? Maybe. No, I'm not going for my world's invite. I don't even know how many points I have. It's like 300 or so. I, I'm not I'm not trying for my world's invite this year. I'm not going to worlds this year. I don't want to go to worlds this year. Uh, I'm having a baby in September. I appreciate the compliment, Logan. Thank you.
no, I'm not going to LA. I'm not going. I the only other event I'm going to is NAIC. That's it. So. Yeah, no, I have a, I have a child due in. Uh, if I win NAIC, will I go to World? No, I have a baby due in September. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Come on, chat. Have some priorities. My for my firstborn child. Not to say that a secondborn child would be any different, but my firstborn child is due in September. Okay, I'm not going to the World Championships this year. Am I doing Twilight? Yes. So we do have uh, we do have plans to do the Twilight Masquerade testing. I got Jesse coming in on Wednesday. And uh, and it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, this this event was crazy, dude. There are so many people here. I will say it kind of feels, and I don't know if anybody else has had this experience. It kind of feels like Mario Kart. Um, in that. Like, once you get out into the lead, it's kind of easier to stay up there. Like, back in the pack, anything can happen back in the pack. But once you, like, get out into the lead, you just have to worry about the blue shell. And uh, I guess Andrew Hedrick was the blue shell. But, yeah, it kind of feels like... Dialga is the blue shell, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know, and I <laughs> I got hit by the blue shell a lot, all right? Yes, I did get hit by the blue shell a lot. I did believe in Diago and no one else did. The duck is good. The duck is good. I think that uh I think that people have figured out like the optimal list now. And I'm I'm proud of us here on the channel. We were pretty close, you know. We were within a couple cards of this. We were on the 3-3 Dialga. We were on the 4-4 Matang. We were on high supporter counts. I mean, like four research, four Iono. I was at like either four Iono, three research, or sometimes I was at 4-4. We were on two boss, a counter catcher, and a prime catcher for a while. So three boss, prime catcher, no counter catcher. That's cool too. The gears are where we were not. I was not on the fourth rod. I was on three rod. The gears. Two Buddy Buddy Poffin I consider to be very greedy, but. I don't I don't really know how this deck sets up consistently enough with only two Buddy Buddy Poffin. Oh, I never explained why Zom Zomazenta doesn't matter because you just push around it an iron hand like the amount of times I pushed around the Zamazenta and just iron hands whatever they put up like so if they attack with Zamazenta and they have a two prizer on the bench you could just prime catcher up the two prizer and knock it out if they t attack with Zamazenta and they only have one prizer on the bench then you just you just uh, you bundle it out of the way and just iron hands whatever they promote and then Zamazenta cannot knock out iron hands you see how problematic that is? So. Yeah. The Zamazenta doesn't really matter against Chen Pao. That's not what makes the matchup bad. What makes the matchup bad is the fact that they've got a 280 hit point Pokemon that barely needs any energy on it to one hit KO your main attacker. They could take two prizes uh, or they could take back-to-back -back turns and knock out your guys. Yeah, that's that's what makes it bad. And they've got nothing on their board that you can hit with like Radiant Greninja. Right? It, it just turns into a race and their deck is lower to the ground than yours. Like their deck is easier to set up than yours is.
Right. You could have two backs caliber set up and your opponent could just go boss V star prime catcher knockout. And it's just, then you lose. Right. So like, that's not great. It's not great. Yeah. The V star is kind of insane against your deck. That's for sure. I do like kind of how retro this deck feels. It does. It feels almost like, like a 2017 deck or something. Yeah. Right. That's pretty cool. Oh, I guess we could talk about my list compared to the other Chen Pao lists. Sure. I'm not actually, I didn't actually check and see if there's anything crazy going on. I'm pretty sure all of us are within like a card or two of each other. Because, yep. Yeah, so like Grant is literally playing uh, Reagan's top four list, right? From Orlando. Nick Moffitt was on two Chen Pao and where did he make up for the two Chen Pao? The fourth candy. Okay. But then also didn't have the uh, and played the 3-2 Bibero. Okay. You know, thank you Angel for the raid. No, Jesse was trying to convince me to play the Lost Vacuum at the event, and I decided that Lost Vacuum would have been very bad, and uh, and I stand by that. I would not have used, I would not have used Lost Vacuum once. I thought back on it after. Uh, so yeah, so Nick played the third Badoof and the two Chen Pao, but also had the four Candy. A lot of us were on four Candy. See, Eddie North was also on the four candy, but still had the cologne. And he was able to make room for that by cutting a stop. So he cut a stop for that, went to two stop. I actually was playing, uh, I was playing two stop on stream for a long time because I thought that Reagan only played two poke stop at Orlando, but I realized that I'm just stupid and cannot apparently look at things correctly. So for the longest time, for the longest time, I thought, like until literally like the night before the tournament, I thought Reagan's list only had two stop in it. But then like Jesse told me, like literally the day before the event, Jesse was like, yeah, Reagan's list has three stops in it. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, bro. And I'm like, oh. Well, that probably makes this deck like a whole lot better. So I put, I put the third stop in. But I I certainly spent a lot of time playing with two stop. Uh, and it, it's doable, but three is better. And then the best Chen Pao list in the room right here is what you see. Deck list played by me and Kieran ended up on the same exact list. And Kieran's actually kind of gross kind of goaded because after our best of three concluded me and Kieran he's like he's like we're on the same 60 and I'm like what he's like yeah bro he's like we both made the same exact changes he's like we both took out the 70 hit point Friggy and we're both playing the fourth rare candy <laughs> yeah. I was like I was like bro you're a wizard how did you know that and sure enough, he was 100% correct. Me and Kieran had never spoken before this event. We had never spoken once. And then we played against each other, and we both had the exact same 60. So that was kind of a funny a funny little happenstance there. I did talk about those changes, yeah, on stream. Oh, I definitely did. But I don't think that he I don't think that he referenced I don't know. I don't think that he watches Tricky Jim or anything, so but yeah. So uh would I change anything about this list? Nope. Jack says I almost played this exact 60 as well, but didn't want to be in a blender all day. It's so fun. Once you kind of like, you just have to put the time in with it. D 
Did I miss Cologne? No. I think like part of me was like, I guess Cologne is an, it's like an extra out to Snorlax, I guess, right? Was there any point where I missed disruption? No. Did I get any double backs prized? No. There's only a 1 in 100 chance of that happening, and it didn't happen. Yeah. Would I change the Cypher Maniacs? No, you have to play those idiots. <laughs> I, I think you kind of have to play those morons. Yeah. Because, like, there's times where... Uh, I actually did not Silene meaningfully one time the entire tournament. There were times where I was like, I may have to Silene. Um, so I was like saving the Silene just in case. But, uh, uh, I, okay, I maybe Silene meaningfully like twice. But it, it's very important to have this here. I just didn't get aried a lot either. So like the Silene's really good if you happen to get aried or something. No, the Chen Pao's, you just want to start Chen Pao in a lot of matchups. Because Chen Pao allows you to shivery chill and get your energy going for Radiant Greninja. That's how you lose. Like, you lose, if you can't get the energy flowing, you lose. It's just like, sometimes there's not a ton of energy in this deck. If you can't get the energy out of the deck, you are going to lose. So, like, that's kind of what, got me going on the on the Chen Pao. Like, you just opening Chen Pao is really good. Just getting the energy flowing out of the deck is really good. Kirby TCG, I disagree with you completely. Uh, Silene is actually really good. It is not terrible. Uh, recovering valuable resources in a deck that discards a lot of cards is insane especially in a format where airy exists and your opponent can at whim look into your hand and discard two of whatever they want <laughs> yeah. yeah also this deck only plays prime catcher so think about if you're not playing silene then you better play boss's orders or something because you're gonna need you want one more out to a gust so it's like Silene. So think of Silene not like, like think of Silene as like this has to be another gust if it's not Silene, right? But it's like it's a more versatile second gust. So it's like this could be boss. This could be a counter catcher. It could be something like that. But instead, it's just best as a Silene because the Silene in a pinch could be a second gust. Yeah, the Silene's just like your your it's your fail safe. There's so many times where it was like in Mew, like in Mew for a long time was playing Silene too. And it was so good in Mew Mew V Max. For the same reason. Uh it was so good because you could just get back that extra uh Being able to get back that extra power tablet or whatever, right? Yeah, it's just such a flexible card. There were definitely times where I'm like, I'm, I'm saving the Silene in my hand for like a game-winning play, right? There were certainly times where it was kind of like, and there were definitely times throughout the event where I was like, all right, I just need to dig deep enough to find my Silene, or I need to stop using Pokestop. There are definitely times in the event where it's like, okay, I need to stop using Pokestop because I, I could hit the Silene, right? So like, and, and that's part of, I mean, you start to get like this kind of awareness. You know exactly what's in your deck. You know exactly what's in your prize cards. You know exactly what's in your discard pile. You know, you have the exact knowledge of where everything is. And you're like, okay, I need to, you know, I need to continue digging until I find the Silene. Once I find the Silene, I can start using Pokestop again, right? But like, if you find, yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts for sure. The Silene is really good. 
especially since you could do things like Silene Pokestop, you can Silene Bibarel, you can Silene Concealed Cards. Oh, I had a whole bunch of Pokestops that just sucked. Yeah, for sure. But you also has you need to you need to play it though. But I did have some just ugly Pokestops. Yes. Yeah, you just take the ugly stop. The ugly stops are part of it. You play three rod. Who cares? You know, ultimately, you only there were there were so many turns throughout the tournament where I didn't play a supporter. I think like that, and that's okay. You know, you don't need like the way the deck is built. You don't even need them supporters, bro. Like what you need, you just need the supporters to get set up. And then Cypher Maniac, uh, another reason I really like Cypher Maniac, probably, I know, someone could, you know, they're, okay. Ugh. God, did I just really say that? Anyways, one of the reasons Cypher Maniac has to be in the deck is because it allows you to go fish out this stupid lightning energy. Like, there's some times where maybe your vessel, you don't have access to it. It's just like, it's another way, it's another way to go get the stupid lightning, Okay. It's like thing it's like a second and a third out to like guarantee the lightning energy. So like it's good for that. But this card also sucks. It's so bad. If you want proof of that, see my top eight match against Andrew Hedrick, where it did nothing, and I proceeded to promptly lose the game because I played Cypher Maniac as my supporter for turn and said pass. With a fridge Bax in the active, doing nothing. Yes, those are the downsides. Like, Cypher Maniac's only good if you've got some things going. It doesn't actually do anything, right? Like, it doesn't actually... Right. It's basically only here because we can't play five Irida. We would play six Irida. All right. We just would. <laughs> I did have a couple of turns where I went turn one Cypher into Pokestop. That was sick. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I had a couple of those. I never attacked with Bundle. No. Bundle simply used Hyper Blower. That's what he was there for. Play Pal Pad instead of Cypher? Absolutely not. How about Counter Catcher instead of Bundle? No, the Bundle's like the best card in the deck. Have I not told you this entire time I've been talking about this deck? Have you not? I, I've talked... I've talked about how broken the bundle is constantly. Zard's an auto loss. If you start Chen Pao and they go turn two Zard belt. Oh yeah, you're getting destroyed. Well, the Zard matchup. If, well, how many match, how many matchups, how many matchups um, have I said you lose if you start Chen Pao and your opponent goes first and gets the turn two knockout on it. Like, yeah, okay, all right, sure, whatever. You know, but that is that not just like the state of the format? You know, if Chen Pao goes first against the turn two Radiant Greninja on you, like there's a lot of there's a lot of games where you just win, right? Uh, I know Ian Rob did play Belt, right? But he said that it was just a one-off tournament where he played Belt. So... Yeah, it's like a either you body or get bodied, right? Yeah, body or get bodied. That's just the that's the name of the game. Body or get bodied. You can't be worried about like what if that's why nobody plays radiant nobody plays Manaphy. Because you're like you just are body or get bodied. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how things go. How does Chen Pao change for Twilight Masquerade? Well, you're probably going to need bigger Fridgy backs, huh? Yeah. 
you probably what just have to play the 70 hit point ones but i don't even know if that's enough to save you so let's see what we got some new cards revealed that's pretty exciting All right. This is interesting news. Let's read this. To promote the fact that they're developing the Pokemon TCG Pocket, DNA has announced it has renamed its Pokemon subsidiary from DNA Digital Production to Pokemon Card D Studio. That's cool. The subsidiary was originally established in February 2020, just six months after the release of post Pokemon Masters EX. It's a joint investment owned 66 DNA and 33% the Pokemon Company. Its stated purpose is to promote collaboration between the two companies. In their press release, DNA states, Pokemon Card D Studio Co. aims to leverage the experience gained from developing Pokemon Masters EX in order to provide stable global services for Pokemon TCG Pocket. Ooh. DNA currently lists a 50 million yen capital for the subsidiary, or that's not a lot. Yeah, $300,000. Not a lot for like, business crap <laughs> uh, for like, you know, Pokemon stuff. Colony refers to the money and assets a company possesses for its operations and projects. Yeah, that's not a ton. And presumably renaming the subsidiary is a demonstration of DNA's commitment to Pokemon TCG Pocket since DNA owns two thirds of the subsidiary. They will be incentivized to support the app for years to come. Cool. All right. Seems nice. And then we got some new cards from the upcoming set, Night Wanderer. Night Wanderer was revealed seconds ago in Japan's Champions League tournament. The set will be headlined by Petarunt, EX, Ogidogi EX, Monkey Dory EX, and Pheasantipity EX. As posted before, Night Wanderer will release in Japan on June 7th. It will feature 64 cards before Secret Rares. We originally discovered its trademark in September 2023. The set name is a reference to Petrant and the Loyal Three stealing Ogre Pond's masks during the night. The story was featured in the Teal Mask DLC. We expect the cards from Night Wanderer to become a part of our special English set in August. Following Night Wanderer, Japan will be getting a Stellar Miracle set in July, featuring Stellar Terra Pokemon EX, including Terrapagos EX. Thus, Night Wanderer will be the last set to focus on the teal mask. Thanks goes to Jake C. and Justin Basil for the translations. All right. Uh, these are going to be new to me. A few of these are going to be brand new to me. I've read a couple of them. I've read the Kiram. I know people want to want to hear about the Kiram. All right. We'll, uh, we'll talk. Ogdogi EX is a 250-point. 250 hit point Pokemon EX with two attacks. Its first attack, Poison Muscle, allows you to search your deck for two basic dark energy and attach them to this Pokemon. If you attach any energy in this way, this Pokemon is now poisoned. So it poisons itself. 250 hit point basic Pokemon. Is this just the new normal? Is this just where we're at? The Terra cards have been leaked? Where are they at? Are they real? Twitter, huh? Oh, they might be fake. And then Crazy Chain. Like cell phone picture leaked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy Chain, 130 damage plus. If this Pokemon is poisoned... The attack does 130 more damage. You know it's bad when I'm like reading a card and I'm like, ah, 260 damage for three. That's okay. <laughs> Why? What is wrong with the world, man? What is wrong with the world? Where I'm like, 250 hit point basic can do 260 for three. 
Ah, it's all right. You know, why, why? God. All right. Monkey Dory EX. All right, what, what's the... You guys want to... This is... Okay. The attacks of the poison Pokemon's cards has to do 40 more damage. Holy smokes. Cool. Culver says tenacity. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... With the Binding Moki. And then Petaron has this ability. Okay, Petaron DX. Chain of Command. Once during your turn, you may switch one of your Bench Darkness Pokemon with your active Pokemon. If you do, your new active Pokemon is now po poisoned. Okay. And then Irritating Burst does 60 damage times the number of prize cards your opponent has taken. So if they've taken five prizes, you're doing 300 damage. Okay. All right, I get uh, this is like poison roaring moon. All right, so with the tool, you're doing 40 more damage. All right, this is actually kind of nuts. So let's just say hypothetically, you've got three energy on your Ogie Dogi EX, and that you use Petrant to switch it into the active spot, right? Which is insane because you can dark patch to the bench and then you can use Petrant to switch it into the active spot. And then and then you can attack with your guy and do 260 damage. But if you've got the Moki on him, then <laughs> if he's got the if he's got the Moki on him. <laughs> if he's got the Moki on him, then he's doing 40 more damage. So that's 260 damage plus 40 more damage. He's doing 300 base damage. And then, wait, there's more. Because you know in your poison deck, you got to have Sneasler, right? So you have Radiant Hisui and Sneasler. And you put two more damage counters on your opponent's poison Pokemon. Holy smoke. So that means that you're doing 330 damage. Because with the Moki on him, he's doing base 300. And then... With poison doing 30 more, that's 330. Yeah, either the stadium or Sneasler, whichever. The Sneasler is better because it can't just be easily countered. Oh, the opponent's Pokemon aren't poisoned. You're not poisoning them? You're right. God, reading comprehension. Man. Huh. You could use Brute Bonnet, though. What about Brutus? But then you have to play the stinky Brutus and the stinky... No, no, no. All right. You're just not hitting 330, bro. Yeah. You're not hitting 330, bro. Yeah, you already got to have this guy and then you got to have this guy. You don't want the stadium in play. Then your guy's taking more damage. He's poisoned after all. Yeah, Kieran. I guess Kieran is how you're doing it, right? You don't think you need the runt? So you think you're just going to play this guy with Brute Bonnet instead? No runt? The runt seems pretty good, guys. I'm going to... I'm going to be honest with you this card is kind of broken no no this card is going in the dang deck you guys are tripping if if you want to play this card without this card 
you're nuts. <laughs> you're nuts. You're just nuts. You're nuts. You're off your rocker. All right. You're off your dang rocker if you want to play this card without the card that was built for that card. This card. All right. This You realize you'd have to play zero Switch? This is one card that makes it so you no longer have to play Switch. Think of how many Switch you'd have to, you'd have to, you'd have to dedicate like four spots to Switch at least. And then you still might miss it sometimes. Dark Patch only goes to the bench, guys. Don't need switch, bro. This guy's got a retreat cost of three. <laughs> yeah, this guy's got a retreat cost of three. What you mean? You're playing this guy. All right. I know you don't need Brutus. This guy poisons. I know. I'm telling you guys are playing. The, the, the Petra Runt goes with the dang Ogie Dogie EX. All right. Stop. Stop tripping. If you want to do 330 damage. Let's see. So you're doing. You're doing 260. All right. So the. Oh, but you got the Moki. So you're doing. You're doing 300. You're chilling, dude. You're chilling. You do 300 base. If you want to do 330, just play Kirin. Yeah. Nah, just play the Kirin, bro. Not that. Oh. Man. This is killing me here. Karen. This card. Right there. You just play that one. But uh, accelerating energy to these guys is going to be like so annoying, right? So like, right, this switches and it boosts by 30. That's fine. You realize like there's only four dark patch in your deck, which is why you got to play it with dark Rye V star. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah bro you go turn one poison muscle alright but what if you go turn one poison muscle and then your opponent just knocks you out oh yeah this is a dark V star deck for sure you gotta do yeah all right, so here's the deck. Darkrai V-Star, Petcharunt, Ogie Dogie EX. That's the deck. And you get Ninja. Oh, yeah, and, and Radiant Greninja. What's your ace spec? Prime Catcher. Or unfair stamp, one of those two. Because you can unfair stamp. Yeah, Dark Rise is pretty good. Being able to unfair stamp twice is pretty nice. Not max belt. Why would you play max belt if the Moki boosts your attack by 40? It's like that's just 10 less damage, and this is not an A spec. No, no, no. Yeah, you're not playing max belt, bro. You got the Moki. All right, so that's the deck. 
you have to play with Dark Patch. You have to play. You probably are playing Pokestops too. Not an Arvin deck. Because you can go turn one Excel to yourself, right? So you do that. You go turn one Excel to yourself. You've got Darkrai. You've got like Radiant Greninja. And you've got this guy. And that's like the whole deck. You probably play Pokestops. Just like, it's going to feel similar to Roaring Moon decks, right? I guess you don't, maybe you don't want to play Pokestops because you could discard your your stupid tool. Yeah, maybe you play a combination of both, right? Just like Roaring Moon, like literally exactly like Roaring Moon did. You might play like well, one town store and two stops. No, you can't play Energy Switch and Sada because these guys aren't ancient. So you have to play Dark Rye V Star instead to get back to Dark Patch. All right. Anyways, that's that's pretty cool deck. Monkey Dory EX. Monkey Dory EX has the ability to skip a beat. If this Pokemon is knocked out by damage from an opponent's attack, while you have a Petrarant EX in play, your opponent takes one less prize card. Oh, cool. Dirty Headbutt, 190 damage. Okay, so it's basically a 210 hit point basic Pokemon that only gives up one prize. Man. It's kind of messed up. All right, and then Fesendipity EX. 210 hit points. If one of your Pokemon is knocked out during your opponent's last turn, you may draw three cards. What? They reprinted Oracorio? What? What the heck, bro? They literally brought Oracorio GX back. What the heck, bro? That's crazy. I I was talking about Oracorio GX like last week. I know. I forget what deck I was saying it'd be good in, but I was saying it would need to be like a single prizer or something. All right, and then uh, Cruel Arrow. 100 damage, 20, and it snipes. Wow, this card's nuts. All right, this card's going to be good. It's a good card. This is a really good card. Oh, I would say fighting GLC. Right, right, right. Needs like an Oracorio ability. Wasn't Oracorio GX played in Blown sometimes? Oh, Oracorio GX was the draw card of the Blacephalon deck, yes. This is a really good card. This is an insane card. This is so good. Holy smokes. Dang. Feels like it's worse now? I promise you it's not. This card is also going to be good. It'll, it will get its time. This card will get its time. For show. Sure. The fact that you can just, you can just nest ball for this thing, dude. You can just nest ball for it and then just be like, bam. Plus three. You know how often your nest balls turn into a plus three draw these days? They don't. <laughs> they don't. Your nest balls usually freaking stink. I mean, you can nest ball for Radiant Greninja. I mean, like, yeah, but now you can nest ball for Fezzendipity. You can Radiant Greninja, then Fezzendipity. But yeah, this this card is quite good. It is is definitely good. Just like Oracorio GX was good before it. That's cool. And it snipes 100. It's not a bad attack. All right. Yeah, that's crazy. This is like your draw guy in this deck. Wow, that's cool.
And then there's Kiram. First, let's read these two trainer cards. Neutral center is a new A spec. Stadium, which prevents all damage done to the Pokemon. It prevents all damage done to Pokemon that don't have a rule box by attacks from your opponent's Pokemon AX and Pokemon V. Holy smokes. If this card's in your discard pile, it can't be put into your deck or hand. You cannot recover it. I don't know why... I don't know why they put this text on these cards. Why don't they just have, like, if this card would go to the discard pile, it goes to the Lost Zone instead. Why don't they just say that? But I guess, like, they don't want to increase the amount of cards that go to the Lost Zone. I guess, like, that it kind of weirdly buffs Lost Zone. Yeah, yeah. So that's why they that's why they don't do it. I do think it's a little bit weird that you're making you're you're effectively lost zoning it without actually sending it to the lost zone. Like I don't actually like that. But check out Teleport Room Goth for expanded. Expanded is a Mickey format, but sure, I'll look at it. Wait a minute. It can't, it can't be put back. <laughs> it can't be put back into your deck or hand. But what about directly into play? Checkmate. Man, how funny is that? But it only protects against Pokemon EX and Pokemon V. So. If it protected from all Pokemon that have a rule box, it'd be much stronger. That's kind of funny. Wow. All right. Sure. And that way, you can sigh report your opponent to death. <laughs> Thank goodness. Dealing 60 damage a turn. How broken is that? A simple counter to that is you just vac you could just play vacuum, right? Thank you, Brady, for the sub and the 58 months. Appreciate it. Yeah, that seems like pretty bad combo, but it's all good. And I don't think it's it's too cheese. It's not actually like funny, but not actually good. It it this combo wouldn't withstand any like anybody trying to actually counter it. It would not withstand any of it. Colrus's tenacity is a new supporter. It allows you to search your deck for a stadium card and an energy card and put them into your hand. That's kind of fun. Huh. Colrus is like, is he fixing his glasses? What is he doing here? He's got his hand in his face. Goose Mahala at home. It's true. A stadium card and an energy card. Do you see how important it was that we banned Research Lab? Do you see now? In Gym Leader Challenge? Do you, do you all see? I knew I was right. I was right the whole time. It was only going to get worse. The amount of turn one Archeops y'all would have been dealing with. Turn one Archon, turn two Archeops. Absolutely ridiculous. So, yeah. Thank God we don't have to deal with that anymore. Dang, feels good to be right. Yeah, turn one, I'll go get my research lab and my capture energy.
Yo, dragon? Dragon, though? Dragon? Bro. I've got two Goose Hollas for my dragon deck. Man, that double dragon's going to be so easy to go get. That is hilarious. All right, and then, of course, we've got the new Kyurem. Okay. New Kyurem, 130 hit point, Dragon Pokemon. No weakness, gnarly-looking artwork. Love it. Kyurem is my favorite ice chicken dragon Pokemon. Of all the ice chicken dragons, Kyurem, Kyurem is the best one. And Pokemon... Pokemon is pulling a play out of their Mu V Max hate book with Lost Zone decks. Lost Zone decks are just getting absolutely checked by this card. It's nuts, right? Like, it's got the ability Anti Plasma. If your opponent has a card with Colrus in its name in their discard pile, the attack cost of this Pokemon's Triforce is just one colorless. And then it's Triforce, which normally costs two water, two metal, and a colorless. Can be used for just one colorless if your opponent has Colrus in their discard pile. Any Colrus card. Discard all energy attached to this Pokemon. That would be one energy if you your opponent has a Colrus in the discard pile. This attack does 110 damage to three of your opponent's Pokemon. What? Hundred ten to three. Just run two Manaphy. Uh, and it. You know that it's very intentional. It does 110 damage to three. So you can knock out the Cramorants too. You knock out the Cramorants. You knock out the Sableyes. The only thing you're missing is the Radiant Greninja. But let's be completely honest. I guess Tina decks are still out here thriving. Okay. I'm thinking to myself, like, is Lawson really going to continue to be that relevant with Dragapult around? It's kind of what I'm thinking. Like, Dragapult really kind of eats these confies, doesn't it? You know, with, with this Colra supporter, you know we're going to get the the nastiest special energy. You already know. Yo, the Greninja Frost last deck. Holy smokes, here we are. Greninja Frost last. It's so broken. This is the deck the people have wanted. Finally. How does this beat any deck that plays a mana feat? I don't really, I guess, really? I don't know, man. I don't really see it, but. I guess you frost last the mana feat.
What do you mean this deck has zero draw power? You're looking at it right here. Right, and you use your hyper aroma to go get three, uh, to go get, you could get three frost lasts. You just use hi use hyper aroma to set up. You irida for hyper aroma. Yo, irida with hyper aroma, kind of nuts. Just saying, it's kind of crazy. Oh, that's kind of cool. I have to save that one for later for sure. That that's gonna be a play on stream kind of deck. Yo, what you cooking up over here? No way. <laughs> no way. This is crazy, man. Raging Bolt is so back. I guess this beats Dragapult, right? It's just Raging Bolt and the Mask Guy. That's it. Was it ever? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. I heard Maridon is back. This is what I've been hearing. Uh, allegedly. Allegedly, Maridon is no longer washed. In Japan, anyways. So, there's a couple of things that are like... That are that are really good for Dragapult or for Maridon. Maridon is a very fast and aggressive deck that can take two prizes on Dreepies and stuff, right? It won the Champions League. There was a Champions League? Why am I not looking at those lists? Where's the results? Limitless doesn't have it yet. It's cool. Limitless will have it like tomorrow. We'll talk about it tomorrow. That's fine. We've talked about a lot of other stuff today. I'll talk about the Champions League stuff tomorrow. Dang, yeah. Hands hands won? That's crazy. Well, Marida, it does seem like it has like a really good... Uh, All right, this was the top 16 of the Sapporo Champions League. We had Maridon, Guardi, Dragapult, Lugia, Dragapult, Snorlax, Maridon. Goodness. Gouging fire. And so this makes sense, right? This is like a direct, a direct kind of like retaliation of these like Dragapult EX decks, right? So like Dragapult EX became very popular and very big in Japan. And Dragapult EX does 200 damage and then like spreads 60 damage to the bench. But it probably is a little slow to set up and you can take advantage of that with a very fast Iron Hands. So you just set up Iron Hands really quickly. You got the rescue board for your Tatagiri. Uh, you go fast Iron Hands. And you can take a couple prizes that way, get enough energy in play, use Raichu V to uh, absolutely blast a Dragapult to smithereens with two copies of Bravery Charm and a copy of the Heavy Baton. You can make it so that your guys pass their energy back or, you know, don't get knocked out. That's pretty sick. Yeah, apparently Maridon's back. And then... Apparently, Lugia is like the other popular deck, right? Like, Lugia was very popular. Maridon just eats Lugia. The guys are too big to care about Dragapult. You're like, these big... It makes sense, all right? So, like, Dragapult kind of eats up the the little guys in evolving decks. So then big basic decks rise to the forefront, right? Because big basic decks are going to beat Dragapult decks. 
So this is exactly the way it makes sense, right? It's funny because in our current meta, Miraidon is terrible. But our current meta is different. In our current meta, you can play 360 hit point Frigibax in your deck and it and you won't get punished for it necessarily. So that's kind of crazy. All right, so we've had some people asking, Ayo. All right, so you get the water energy into play with Palkia, then you move them around with Plissy. It's genius. It's genius. It's freaking genius. It's the Guardy Monkey Dory combo. I don't like the Guardy deck. All right. I don't like Guardy in this format. What makes you think I'm going to like the deck in next format? I don't think that the inclusion of a Darkness Energy and the Silly Monkey makes me like Gardevoir any more than I like it right now. Guardy still feels like Cope to me. Uh, of all the decks that play Rare Candy, Guardy is probably the fourth best one. Why would I play the fourth best Rare Candy deck right now? You've got Chen Pao, you've got Charizard, you've got Pidgeot Control, and then Guardy. Like I said, the fourth best rare candy deck. So I, I'm not a big... Well, in our current standard, the three best rare candy decks are Pidgeot, Control, Chen Pao, and Charizard. Like, very clearly. Next format, I mean... That probably changes a little bit, but I still feel like Guardi is like not as powerful as the other rare candy decks. So I just, yeah, I'm not really sold on Guardi at all. I guess like okay, I get what you could do, right? So like the Monkey Dory, you could move three damage counters from one of your Pokemon to one of your other opponent's Pokemon. You have to put the Darkness Energy onto it. You have to use the Earthen Vessel to go get the Darkness Energy, put it onto the Monkey, and then you can use you know, guard of war to put damage counters on your own guys. And you move those damage counters over to your opponent's guys. Right. So like it can allow you to hit bigger numbers essentially, or like heal your guys. Once you accelerate, I, that doesn't fix it to me. That doesn't, that doesn't fix it. Oh, and they're playing zero rare candy. I <laughs> got, you're right. You're right. There's no more candy. All right. G Guardy doesn't play candy anymore. Fine. Of all the stage two decks, it's the fourth best stage two deck. Yes, they're off candy next for or they've been off they've been off candy this format too. That shows how much I know about this deck, but fine. Of all the stage two decks then. I was just making generalizations. It seems like it's the fourth best stage two deck. And I don't think that the, the cheeky monkey strategy really like. It doesn't like fix the deck for me. It doesn't make it like so much better than it was. Uh, to me, Guardy's still. You just your reliance on tools is annoying. Your reliance on the fact that your Pokemon can just get vacuumed and then you like get double knocked out and you lose. Deck is generally very weak to Iron Hands. Like, are we just talking about how Iron Hands is getting like even better next format with Turn One Iron Hands and Maridon, and yet, like Guardy's got nothing for that. I 
I think some people just want to play Guardy because they like Gardevoir the Pokemon. Don't act like I'm not correct. Don't act like I'm don't act like I'm wrong. You just like Gardevoir the Pokemon and you want to play the Gardevoir deck. That or you already own two thirds of the deck. And you just want to, and you played it last format and you still want to play it this format. That's what, that, to me, that's what it seems like. All right. Ben Morse likes specifically drawing cards with a refinement. There are a whole bunch of decks that let you draw cards. But Guardy's not the same as it used to be. You could say the same thing about Chen Pao heads. I don't like the Pokemon Chen Pao or Baxcalibur. And I really don't like the Pokemon Greninja. <laughs> Here, what's my favorite Pokemon in this deck? I don't like any of these dudes. They're all ugly. <laughs> no, I really don't like hired hands. Yeah, this is probably the coolest guy in the deck. Yeah. Badoof and Bieberel. Yeah, they're the coolest guys. Third place is probably Chen Pao. He's kind of neat. But like, they're pretty much all C tier Pokemon in this deck. No, Greninja is included in that C-tier assessment, 100%. <clears throat> Remember in the elitism discourse when randoms were like, these top players don't even like Pokemon? That's not true. I freaking love Pokemon. Look at this crap on my wall, okay? Like, look at all this. I love Pokemon. I just don't like any of these Pokemon. <laughs> Badoof, he's cool. I'm, I'm sorry, Badoof. All right, you're. I said you were the coolest one up there. I did say that. All right, I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. All right, Badoof. He's all right. But like I said, getting to play the Drag Trode deck. Drag Trode. Now that deck was cool. All right. You're going to look at this Chen Pao deck and, and look at me with a straight face and tell me that there are cool Pokemon in here. When the other deck that I played this weekend... Looks like this? You're going to tell me that my deck has cool Pokemon in it when the other deck I was playing this weekend had this? You're serious right now. No, this is a cool deck. <laughs> All right. Imagine your standard deck looks like this. Now, this is a proper stage two deck, all right? This is, yeah. This is fire right here. Oh, dang. My list was one card off of Alex Brousseau's list. Two cards off of Alex Brousseau's list. I thought I had Alex Brousseau's list built exactly, but no, it is two cards different. The list I was playing only had two rainbow in it, and it had only one Scott in it. And it had a fourth Steven's advice. 
one other card. Not quite sure what that was, though. That's interesting. So a couple cards off Alex Brousseau's list, but basically his list. Yeah, I had two rainbows, one Scott, four Stevens. I don't know what the last card was. I have to figure it out. No, it isn't four admin. I have it right here. I'll look at it. Now I'm now you got me curious. All right. It's two rainbows. The Holland Scientist and the Holland Adventurer. Yeah, one Scott, two admin, three mentor. In before I was playing a fifty nine card deck. That'd be so sick. Ah, Nah, he didn't play the cast. The cast form actually is insane. All right, yeah, Alex Brousseau's tripping. You need to play the cast form for sure. Yeah. Sorry, Alex. Yeah, the cast form's nuts, actually. I use that cast form all the time. Yeah. So, it's basically, is minus one rainbow, plus one cast form, minus one Scott, plus one Stevens. So, like, very, it's two cards different. But, yeah. You're going to tell me that Bax Caliber is cool, bro? When you could be playing Mu EX, Minetric EX, Regirock EX, Deoxys EX? Seriously? Look at this deck. Flareon EX, Umbreon EX, Esprion EX, Vaporeon EX. Jolteon EX. Quit playing with me as if you wouldn't go crazy if this deck was standard legal right now. Quit playing with me. Quit playing with me, chat. You guys would go nuts for this. Yeah, no, I didn't like any of these Pokemon in this deck. I the bundler, bro. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the bundler the bundler is growing on me a little bit. <laughs> Nostalgia got me. No, the cards just don't look the No. Chen Pao is okay. This is not nostalgia talking. Compare these two cards. Backs Caliber. Dark Dragonite. Dark Dragonite is objectively cooler. There is no competition. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not close and this is just base rarity we're talking base rarity dog well I guess if the deck was team rockets Chen Pao then it would be a little cooler yeah Look at that. You got your goofy beaver, dude. You've got your ice cats. You've got your, your blue dragon guy. Every time... Every time I was getting out Bax Caliber, mentally, I was calling Bax Caliber Blastoise in my head the entire tournament. <laughs> I was like, all right, I got to get the Blastoise out. <laughs> Like, he's a little bit of an ugly Blastoise, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> kind of an ugly Blastoise. It works. It's fine. I know. Where's my Keldeo EX at? Co19 says, I called the one times hands forever ago. Nice. 
did I predict that these decks were eventually going to be on one hands, one lightning? Uh, not a super hard prediction to make, but I think so because I said like, uh, that's exactly what like the Blastoise Black Karim decks were like exactly. They had, they played two lightning and two and two Black Karim. But yeah, Iron Hands, one Lightning, one Iron Hands. That makes sense. Bax Caliber is a cool Godzilla boy. Uh, it just doesn't. Nah. Not. Nah, not for me, bro. Now, Bibero, he's cool. All right, I'll give it to, I'll give it, I'll give the cool pass to Badoof. I'll give the cool pass to Bibero. I'll give the cool pass to the Bundler. And I'll give the cool pass to Chen Pao. All right, he's got daggers for teeth. All right, he's got to be, he's at least, he's got angry eyes. He's cool. All right, Chen Pao, I was a little too mean to you. You're pretty cool. He's got he's got literally ice teeth and angry eyes. He's he's cool. He's cool. But Baxcalibur is just is just uglier Blastoise. Greninja is like one of the worst Pokemon ever. Iron Hands is just It's like the metal Michelin man. Let's see. Greninja? is not a cool Pokemon. Period. <laughs> just, just point blank. Greninja is not cool, bro. <laughs> Greninja is like the Drake of Pokemon. Everybody likes it, but nobody likes him, all right? People are just too afraid to come out. But finally, I'm going to come out and say it. Nobody likes you, Greninja. <laughs> I don't know what kind of trance you've put on the Pokemon community to make everybody think you're cool. I don't like the tongue scarf. No, I don't like the tongue scarf. Getting ready to drop a seven-minute diss track on Greninja. Yeah, we have Baxcalibur trying to be Godzilla when Tyranitar is right there. See? Like, Baxcalibur just not as cool as Tyranitar. Tyranitar already did it, bro. We already got Tyranitar. You could look at this and tell me Tyranitar is so lame. Shut your mouth. Shut shut your mouth. Yeah, shut, 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 shut your shut your silly mouth. This is like one of the Pokemon cards that got me like just back into Pokemon around 2010. I pulled one of these. I used to like, before I started playing Pokemon competitively, I was going to college and I, uh, and I started opening booster packs. Um, just that I would like buy at Walmart. Just like, you know, I'd, I'd go to Walmart. I'd buy two packs of like Heart Gold, Soul Silver, or Triumphant or whatever, you know, just whatever they had in like the checkout aisle. I would just, I would just buy some cards because I was a casual Pokemon fan, right? I just would, and I had a collection of cards. I would just, you know, I'd, I'd buy a pack. I'd put my favorite cards in my binders, right? Um, which I still had and kept around. Pulling this card was like one of the things that got me back into Pokemon cards. Because this card was so sick. I like pulled this card and I was like, I actually just, 
yeah, I wonder if there's any good Tyranitar Prime decks out there. <laughs> I was like, I want to play with this thing. This thing is so dope. I want to play with it. That's, that 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 like got me interested in playing again. To my dismay, there were no good Tyranitar Primes, but uh, Prime decks really. But yeah, it was it was hype. Tyranitar definitely got it a lot of ugly cards. There's some cool ones though. That one's hard. That one's hard. You know, maybe Baxcalibur eventually will get. I mean, Tyranitar Tyranitar's got some Ugos. Like it would be so easy to just you know make fun of Tyranitar if this if this was the only artwork Tyranitar had. Making fun of Tyranitar would be so easy. If this was the only <laughs> If this was the only <laughs> All right, I was about to roast this Tyranitar, but this one's actually sick, so I can't even roast this, bro. <laughs> I can't even roast this one. No, he stands up, bro. Yeah, no, nah, he's cool. He's cool. <laughs> he gets No, no, he gets the pass for sure. Yeah, yeah, he's chilling. He's chilling. No, I'm sorry, Tyranitar. I wasn't going to roast you, bro. <laughs> you're good. You're good. You're good. All right. This one goes hard. This one's cool. Yeah, that one's sick. That one's sick. Obviously, this artwork is amazing. Love that. This artwork is amazing. But yeah, like these XY ones are not good, man. This one where he's about to step on you. <laughs> All right, this, I don't know about this one, guys. How is his leg connected to his body? All right, I don't, I don't believe his leg is like coming out of his abdomen. All right. This one's not it. I just don't get it. <laughs> I must not. <laughs> this Tyranitar is sick, though. This Tyranitar is... I mean, just what are you doing? Like, why are you just like this floating 3D... <laughs> where, where is he going? <laughs> where? In what environment is this Tyranitar exist <laughs> existing? <laughs> is he diving? I have to imagine he's like about to suplex somebody. Like I, I think he should be in like a like in a boxing ring and he's jumping off the top rope. I think that's what's happening. He's jumping off the top rope and he's about to just completely destroy somebody but with no actual boxing ring behind him i have to make that story up because it's no there's no context to why he's floating at a 45 degree angle yeah i know we need more four attack pokemon for sure but anyways yeah i'm a big pokemon fan love pokemon all right. I'm not one of those Pokemon players who doesn't like Pokemon. I love Pokemon, but I definitely have my opinions and I have my favorites. Don't we all though? But you know what? The rankings can always change. Any of you guys see that movie? What was the movie? It's about the the wrestlers. Let's see wrestling movie Zach Efron. The Iron Claw. Did you guys see that? Yeah, Iron Claw. 
the dad's got a ranking of his favorite songs. <laughs> It's it's messed up. <laughs> the dad's got a ranking of his favorite sons, and he tells his sons what their ranking order is. No, he literally tells his sons, like, oh, yeah, like, this one's my favorite. This one's my second favorite. And he tells the son, he has, like, four sons or something. And he tells the sons what their ranking is in order of his favorite. But then he ends it as if this is an upside he ends it by saying but the rankings can always change <laughs> he tier listed in his own sons bro <laughs> who, the, who the heck tier lists their own kids that's messed up Yeah, I mean, it was obviously very funny, you know, because it's like it's so messed up. Deion Sanders literally does this too and posts it on Twitter. That's so toxic. <laughs> to be fair, parents do that, but don't say it out loud. Of course they do. I love all my children equally, but secretly this one is a lot. More difficult to work with than this other one. Yeah, obviously. That kind of stuff happens all the time. But to actually say it? <laughs> you can't say it. <laughs> you can't say it. Come on now. Got to say it out loud so the kids know where they stand and drive to do I think that's I think that was the logic in the uh in the Iron Claw movie which uh if you watch the Iron Claw movie uh, if you watch the Iron Claw movie then you'll see what the result of that kind of toxic attitude uh can have on a family. So just go watch the movie. You'll see you'll see what kind of outcomes will occur if you have that kind of attitude. Yes. So I do recommend watching the movie. It was a really good movie. It's really sad though. So get yourself, yeah, no spoilers, but nothing good happens. <laughs> <laughs> nothing good happens. Yeah, yeah, get some tissues. You'll be all right. But yeah, I love Pokemon. Uh, just these Pokemon. Of all the competitive decks I've played. Well, let's see. I guess Chen Pao is like a pretty cool poster Pokemon for a deck. I mean, Night March, objectively cool, right? You've got literally... Like, objectively cool deck. Pumpkaboo, Joltik. Come on, he's got 30 hit points. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are some of the coolest dudes. Look at all these guys. Lampant? So sick. And Night March is sick. Look how sick this deck is, bro. Garboder, he's cool. Trubbish, he's cool. Evil Tall, he's nasty. Look at that. That card goes nuts. All right. Look how evil this card looks. Like, what the? Dude, this Evil Tall is crazy.
Raikou Electric. Trampa's Arc. This card, this deck literally had a break Pokemon in it. Zorark break. And Dramp Father. Decidueye? All right. Ben Morse was giving me some crap saying that I only like Pokemon before Gen 5. Not true. Decidueye is freaking sick. Decidueye is one of the coolest starters, like, ever. This Pokemon's dope as heck. What the heck? Robin Hood-based Pokemon? Like, what the? This thing's insane. Yeah, that's like an incredible Pokemon design right there. Yeah, Decidueye was fire, dude. Alolan Ninetales? That Pokemon is fire. Look how beautiful this card is. Insane. I wasn't a big fan of the Tapus. I think, you know, like, honestly, I'm cool on the Tapus. I don't I don't really think Tapu Coco is like okay. But like not a huge Tapu fan. But I did like these guys. The Alolan Pokemon I think were done really well. They're cool. Freaking Bozrock, dude. <laughs> Buzzrock? Look at him. That's a cool freaking Pokemon right there. <laughs> the Ultra Beasts are all crazy, dude. And Lycanroc, look how nasty he is. What do I like more, Buzzrock or Lightning GLC? Why you got to put me in a situation like that? Look at Reginald Rock. Look at him, bro. This deck, I've talked about it before on stream. This is one of the best designed Rayquaza cards ever printed. Uh, it's actually like really epic. It makes Rayquaza look really cool. You got to play it with a bug. Yeah, Rayquaza was sick. Don't even get me started on the Zapdos deck, bro. All right. When Zapdos was going to be... I had to play the Zapdos deck. All right. Lights out. I was playing the Zapdos deck. One of my favorite Pokemon. Meta deck. It's the main attacker. I'm playing the freaking Zapdos deck, bro. Ain't no questions about it. Had to play the Zapdos deck. Obviously. For like... For a little while there, Zapdos was a tier one deck. Which was crazy. This was certainly one of my favorite decks that I that I played, like, ever. I mean, it was just so cool. I loved it. I loved the flow of it. I thought it was so sick. Picarom still played Zapdos, okay? And this Zapdos goes crazy. As far as, like, as far as Zapdos artworks go, this is one of the best Zapdos artworks there are. It really is. I mean, this team up, this team up Zapdos really stands up. And it's hard. It is hard. I mean, if you look at like the other Zapdos, it is hard to make a cool looking Zapdos. There are a lot of ways to fail. Because if you mess up, Zapdos is going to end up looking a lot like Big Bird. Okay? I'm just saying, these Zapdos, nah. That, it looks a little, little, too, little too much Big Bird vibes. Pretty much all these Zapdos are terrible. This Zapdos goes kind of hard, but honestly, I'm just okay on it. This Zapdos is sick. Now, that is a proper Zapdos right there. Yeah, with the... Yeah, that's a, that's a proper Zapdos. That's, that's good. That's good. The best Zapdos. 
But yeah, honestly, it's like all, you know, look at these other ones. Even the promo, I don't like the promo nearly as much. The promo is like goofy looking. I don't really know what happened to him. He looks kind of like. Now this, that's how you do a freaking Zapdos right there. I I love this. I mean, that's honestly, that's just like iconic, right? All right, that's how you do a Zapdos art, though. For real, for real. But yeah, this deck was pretty cool. Pikarom, like, objectively a cool Pokemon, right? You got Pikachu with, like, the Zekrom. Yeah, objectively cool card. People love Pikarom. Pikarom was just nuts. This is a cool, cool card. Tag teams, objectively very cool card design, right? I got two Pokemon on the same card, dog. Like, that's nuts. You know, how do we... How we got... Like, literally, we got Pikachu... We got Zekrom. They're on the same Pokemon card. You've got an attack that does like a million damage. As far as Prism Stars go, this was a really cool one. Yeah. God, and I played Rayquaza in this deck. That's so nuts. This deck was sick. I put Hoopa in this deck? I did play Hoopa in this deck. It's funny. This is one of the goofier decks I ever played. 100%. These guys, I don't. <laughs> I don't, I can't really speak on any of the any of these guys. All right. Vileplume, Vileplume, I like Vileplume. Vileplume, good good Gen 1er here, all right? You know, I'm a, I'm a Gen 1er at heart, so getting to play the Pidgeotto, the 1-1 one, one Pidgeotto and the Vileplume all in the same deck, you know, Long neck guy. Yeah, they're all... Is This was a goofy deck for sure. Very goofy. Very powerful though. As JW used it to win that regional and I got 10th. Snorlax VMAX. This will go down, I think, as one of the dopest decks I've ever played to a top 8. And how could it not, right? The only Snorlax VMAX to ever top 8 an event ever. You know, how... Insane. You got Nagan and LGX in here. I mean, all these super insane guys, right? There's literally a Galarian Rapidash in here. A little muck. I mean, this this is like a like look how look how chaotic this deck list is. It's all over the place. Ditto Prism Stars, like an insane Pokemon. And then obviously the Snorlax beat. I mean, just like what a unit, right? Absolute unit. It's so crazy. Altaria's cool. Swablu's cool. And then we're in the modern era, right? I just like, you know... Mew... Mew is my deck. I claimed Mew for sure. Yeah, Mew was my deck. I liked it. I liked it more than any of the other decks. I really did. Mew's cool. Genesect's cool. They're cool Pokemon. The fusion thing was cool. I'm not a big Lugia head. So like Lugia, I'm I'm just fine on Lugia, honestly. The coolest part about this deck is that you got to play the amazing Pokemon. And then Maraida, I think Maraidon is so sick. Because it made me feel like I was like playing the Pikaram stuff again, right? Like you know how much I loved these decks. Getting to play a deck that's like all yellow. That was really hype for worlds. You know, it had been a long time. Like, look how long it had been since I had played what October 2019, since I'd played an all yellow deck again. So it had been four years. Since I played an all yellow deck at a major tournament again. That's a long time. And then as far as like, eh, this deck's all right. On the coolness factor, it's okay. But really, I'm just like not the biggest Baxcalibur fan, I guess is what it boils down to. I think Chen Pao is really cool. It's a Pokemon design. Yeah, he's nice. But I'm, you know, I'm kind of like, a, this would be cooler if it was Blastoise, you know?
So anyways, lots of yapping. But isn't that just what streaming's all about anyways? Yapping about things. We got lots coming up this week as I'm going to be uh, doing our post. Uh, not our post. We're going to be doing our uh, Twilight Masquerade testing starting on Wednesday with uh, Jesse Parker. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Should be a great time. We're going to have some cool decks built and uh, we'll be showing them off on some tabletop gameplay. And. Tomorrow, I'll play some Pokemon TCG Live, all right? That's what we uh, that's what we got on the agenda. But there's maintenance tomorrow. All right. Tomorrow, no maintenance. Okay. There, no, there is maintenance, so no TCG Live. You know, thank you, Jack, for the five gifted subs. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, tomorrow we can watch some Champions League, maybe. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll do that. Yeah, it's... Yeah, 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 yeah. We could talk Champions... Oh, we'll watch Champions League, so then I have an idea of what to build for Tabletop on Wednesday. How How does that sound? That sounds good to me. We'll do that tomorrow. And then we'll have an idea of, of what what decks to build and play on Wednesday. So. All right. Thank you guys all so much for the support, the encouragement, and the wonderful stream. I'll be back tomorrow with some more Pokemon TCG content coming right at you. Thank you so much. I'll see you later. Goodbye.